The next item of business is a debate on motion 23894 in the name of Monica Lennon on protecting Scotland's health and care force. Can I invite those members, uh, care workforce? Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Monica Lennon to speak to and move the motion. Ms Lennon, please. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. On behalf of the Scottish Labour Party, I want to begin with a, a tribute to all healthcare staff on the front line of the pandemic who are working so hard in the most difficult circumstances on behalf of all of us. We couldn't get through this pandemic without the healthcare workers on the front line and those who are behind the scenes, um, some putting themselves at risk every single day just to keep our NHS going and keep caring for others, not just in terms of risk of the virus, but also in terms of people's mental health and well-being. We all know that this second lockdown is not easy for anyone, and so many people are struggling with the isolation and the pressure that comes from juggling so many different responsibilities, from homeschooling to working from home. We need to get this pandemic under control. We need to eliminate the virus, and we need to give people hope, confidence and assurance that we have a pathway to do so. That's why getting Scotland vaccinated must be our top priority and getting the rollout of the vaccine right is in everyone's interests. We've heard again today some horrifying statistics from the First Minister. The numbers of people dying every day is, is far too high and just one loss of life from this virus is one too many. Our thoughts continue to be with everyone who has lost a loved one. Getting everyone vaccinated safely and quickly is crucial to our COVID-19 recovery. And that is absolutely where our collective focus should be. And that's why we must take very seriously the concerns of clinicians, those in the front line who are sounding the alarm. And in this debate today, um, if I can just say to the Cabinet Secretary, we won't be making these points to, to have a go at the government, but what we're trying to do on our benches is reflect what people are saying to us from the front line, their families who are worried at home and people who have very direct experience. So the government amendment, whilst it says lots of things that you know, we, we, we agree with, but it does knock out most of the concerns that we are trying to reflect from the front line in our motion. So we won't be able to support the government amendment today, but we will work with the government to make sure that all of us get this right and that when we raise concerns about the front line, we are doing that with the very best of intentions. So I want in particular to commend BMA Scotland and the doctors that they represent because they have been speaking out about the pressures on the NHS. The current wave of the pandemic and the increased transmissibility of the new variants have placed the NHS under severe pressure and, of course, our social care services too. According to BMA Scotland Chair Dr Lewis Morrison, he said, and I quote, we've used the expression stretch to breaking point so often there's a risk that that phrase loses its meaning, but that is exactly where we are right now. Across the healthcare front line, we know that many others have been raising concerns about the adequacy of current PPE recommendations and what's available to staff. And that's what's reflected in our motion today. The BMA have written to both Public Health England and Public Health Scotland asking for enhanced PPE protection. The RCN also have called for enhanced protection against the new variant and a review of the sufficiency of current PPE advice more generally. Now, I think we would all agree that the virus got so badly out of control in the first place because our governments didn't always act quickly enough during the first uh, wave of the virus. On many fronts, we were too slow on lockdown, on testing and on PPE. So let's not re repeat any of those mistakes when it comes to the rollout of the vaccine and the warnings from staff about the need for more protection. We should be taking a precautionary approach. So we need to listen to those on the front line who are asking for better PPE and we should be providing that to them and trusting their judgment. Access to higher grade masks should be made available to all patient facing healthcare staff as a matter of priority because the levels of hospital-acquired COVID infections show that more action is vital now. 
The Cabinet Secretary knows I pressed her last summer on the, the, the worrying uh, numbers of people catching COVID in our hospital. And we know that we're still not getting this right. In many cases, it looks like it's worse than it was in, in, the, in the first wave. Patients who were admitted to hospital for other reasons have subsequently contracted COVID. And in some cases, they have died. And it's an utter tragedy. This morning, I was contacted by a concerned member of the public whose mother has caught COVID in the hospital. She said, after keeping my 82-year-old mum safe from COVID all these months, she is now tested positive in hospital. She had a massive stroke before Christmas. I would have thought that all frontline staff and patients would be vaccinated as a matter of urgency, but it's not the case. Mum's ward has been in lockdown, so she's obviously got it from a member of staff. I feel it's not good enough. How many other people are getting the virus in this way? You're supposed to feel safe there, but instead it's proving deadly. She said, I know there's nothing you can do to help us, but I just would like you to make you aware that things are not great within the hospital setting. I know there's nothing you can do to help us. Well, I think we all have to take that point away because we do have to help. And I know that MSPs, all of us, our inboxes are bursting with similar stories. So let's today agree that we're going to do something about this. Because the reality is, when we don't act quickly enough to roll out the vaccine and PPE, people will be let down. And the calls for enhanced PPE is not just the BMA, the RCN, it's also the GMB, Unison and Unite, and I refer to my register of interest. We need, we need a safer system of work for all. Um, I will. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way, and I take her point that we want the, the staff and people to be vaccinated first, but she argues for them getting a second dose before older people. How does she handle that, that older people are being pushed down the queue? Monica Lennon. Well, with respect uh, to John Mason, it's um, not these benches have been putting older people down the queue during this pandemic. What's happened to, to older people is an utter tragedy. It's in my view, a humanitarian crisis, particularly what's happened in our care homes, where I believe that older people have been the collateral damage in this pandemic. And that's why on these benches we have fought for and secured a commitment for a human rights-based public inquiry. And we would want that to get underway now, not wait to some time down the future. Um, I'm reflecting the concerns of frontline workers. So if I can turn to home carers, because they're mentioned in our motion too, they do feel this despondent and feel that they have been left behind in the pandemic. They feel that they were last on the list for PPE, last on the list for access to regular testing, and they now fear they will be last on the list when it comes to getting vaccinated. So I think today this debate and our motion can be a signal of intent that home carers, indeed all social care workers, can expect to receive the maximum, not the minimum support from the government. And I do understand the logistical challenges. I've discussed it with the Cabinet Secretary, so other colleagues sitting round about me, but we just need to work harder because we've got home carers who are going out there into people's homes where people have COVID, they feel they've got the, the basic mask, they're still not getting access to regular testing, and they, they're trying to book for vaccines, and when they go online, the vaccine is not there. Absolutely. Cabinet Secretary. I'm very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. Just in terms of PPE, I'm sure the member will recall the agreement that I reached with the relevant unions and with COSLA, that in terms of home care staff, it should be entirely down to their professional judgment what PPE they believe that they need and uh, if they decide and that that PPE should then be made available to them. And if there are instances where that's not happening, I, this agreement was made some time ago. I asked that I was told directly. I've not been told that, but if I am, then I will resolve it. I'm sure the member would welcome that. Monica Lynn. No, I welcome that, that intervention. I think what happens, Cabinet Secretary, is that um, people who are managing staff then revert back to government guidance. I think the government guidance is out of date. We've got home carers today in people's homes looking after people who have COVID and they've just got the basic mask, a basic apron, in a home environment that's poorly ventilated and they feel it's a game of Russian roulette. So I'm glad we've had um, that, that commitment from the Cabinet Secretary because these are the issues that real people are telling us every single day. So let's get it right for our frontline workers. 
uh, presiding officer, I'll move on in the interest of time. So we need to be faster on vaccine rollout. We need to listen to professionals, those in the front line, about how we can resolve delays when they occur. And I welcome the amendment from Donald Cameron, which does emphasise this point. Um, I've had concerns this week also from a, a, a GP. She says, as a GP, we are all concerned about the slowness at which vaccines are coming out to practices, the constant changing timetable of when they will come and the marked disparity between different areas of Scotland. This uncertainty is not helping planning. Patients are also unhappy that they may be waiting weeks longer than people they know of the same age. And now the government are stating that we'll be rolling it out to over 70s and highest risk groups in the next few days. General practice is ready to deliver. We know we can from long experience with flu vaccines, but we need the actual vaccines and a reliable supply to do so. I know it was a talking point today, um, the vaccine that is at First Minister's question, so it's of interest to everyone in this chamber. But again, let's listen to these workers and, and show them that we all mean business and the government will not just brush away people's concerns, but will act on them. And we shouldn't be in a position, presiding officer, where the NHS can only respond to COVID and little else. We need to address this urgently. Otherwise, the risk of long-term damage to Scotland's physical and mental health becomes more challenging by the day. PPE and vaccine rollout is crucial, not only to ensure COVID-safe workplaces, but also to stop staff absence because of the virus. The NHS workforce are at an increased risk of contracting the virus, and staff shortages caused by the virus or self-isolation is putting more pressure on the health service. We've heard from the President of the Royal College of Surgeons, Professor Mike Griffin. He said that the increasing numbers of people off work is a major problem, especially in the west of Scotland, where we know we've already got high levels of health inequality. In conclusion, presiding officer, I began by paying tribute to our health and care workers. I want to end by doing so again. We cannot get through this pandemic without them. We need to support them, not just with warm words and hand claps. We need to get quicker action on PPE, on rapid vaccination and continued testing. I hope other parties will support the motion and I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Lennon. I didn't want to interrupt you, but there is a few minutes in hand for intervention, so perhaps bear that in mind if you're summing up. Um, I'm calling now, who am I calling? I'm calling um, Mary Goujon, Minister, to speak to move amendment 23894.3, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Getting Scotland vaccinated against COVID-19 is indeed the country's national priority, and it's a fundamental part of Scotland's strategic framework for dealing with COVID, and it's critical to us getting society back to some kind of normality. All staff involved in this unprecedented vaccination programme, from those who were vaccinating at the Louisa Jordan last Saturday to the GPs serving our over 80-year-olds in their local communities, Everyone deserves our thanks and support. And that's where I would join with Monica Lennon in her tribute to all the staff who are working so hard to deliver this programme. Now, as the Cabinet Secretary previously outlined to Parliament, to deliver 400,000 doses per week by the end of February, working from national modelling, we estimate we could need around 3,400 vaccinators on a daily basis, dependent on the proportion of staff working part-time. And to date, around 7,700 vaccinators are registered with the vaccination management tool. And we continue to work with our health boards to encourage further expansion of the workforce to build in resilience. Now, this workforce is being drawn from right across the system, whether it's those that are involved in flu vaccination, health board staff, GPs, dentists, optometrists, military personnel. And we've commissioned the British Red Cross to coordinate offers of unpaid volunteer support right across the country. When it comes to training for vaccinators, we will make this as straightforward as possible. Now, I know that this is a point that was raised earlier with the First Minister, and I think it's important to be clear about this. Many of those administering vaccines are already experienced and active vaccinators, but training is still needed to cover the specific characteristics of the COVID-19 vaccinations. For those who are not experienced, even though they may have years of clinical experience, Safety tells us that they need that training plus a bit more. Now, in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, they've already reviewed and streamlined their generic induction training requirements, and we've written to all health boards to ensure that they are doing the same. 
In relation to the vaccination priority, now the JCVI has rightly prioritised frontline health and social care workers, and we've covered over 70% of the core already. Many of these workers will be getting their second dose around the end of February. Now, if we were to do as the Labour motion proposes and prioritise second doses for all frontline health and social care workers before the end of February, I think we need to be crystal clear about the implications of that because it would come at the cost of some of our most vulnerable people. It would divert limited vaccine stock away from protecting those over 70 and people on the shielding list who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Individuals in these cohorts are at high risk from COVID illness and death. The advice from the MHRA, the JCVI and the Chief Medical Officers from all four nations supports that approach. We've also had support from trusted professional bodies like the Scottish Academy, the British Society of Immunology and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. In the situation we find ourselves right now, the efficacy offered by the first dose of vaccine is very good and therefore for the prevention of illness and death for the population and our public health response to this pandemic, we're following the guidance and the position that's been agreed. In relation to vaccine supply, GPs have a significant role to play in delivering the vaccine, especially at this stage of the programme, and we're grateful for their hard work in that. Now, we know that there have been some initial delays in supply reaching some GP practices, and we're working with national procurement and local health boards to resolve any issues. We're also in regular contact with boards to ensure that GPs have the most up-to-date information on vaccine supply. AstraZeneca are working hard to increase their deliveries and quantities will start to improve from the end of this month. But I think it's important to highlight that, as the First Minister mentioned earlier, 75% of GP practices have or are in the process of getting vaccine supplies, and we're still on track to have vaccinated all in JCVI priority groups one and two by the first week in February. We want to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible and are continually working hard to see if this distribution can be made faster. Yes. Jimmy Green. Can I thank the Minister for what is actually a very helpful update. Can I ask a question? It's not to apportion blame, but if there are GPs who are expecting supplies and those supplies don't arrive, where is the blockage? Why are they not getting through to them? And what analysis has been done of how to remove those blockages? Minister. I would just highlight the First Minister talked a lot about that in the questions that she received in the Chamber earlier today. There were issues there about the, the quantity, the number that come in the packs and how those packs are then distributed. But we're in regular contact with boards to find out if there are any issues, if there are any problems with supply. Uh, as I just said, we're working so hard to try and make sure that we iron out those problems as far as we possibly can. And just because we can be allocated a certain amount of vaccine, it doesn't necessarily mean that that al allocation is what is automatically delivered to us. We want to make this process as easy and as streamlined as possible and get those supplies out as fast as we possibly can. And that's what we're continually working to do. And this week, we're going to be writing to all GPs, explaining in more detail the mechanism of the supply of ordering and delivery with suggested solutions at local board level that can also assist them too. So I hope that's helpful in answering the member's question. Home care staff are being vaccinated as part of the frontline health and social care worker group as per the recommendations of the JCVI. Testing for home care staff started on Monday and that includes care at home staff in sheltered housing, daycare and personal assistance. Now that marks a significant expansion in testing and social care, adding again to the layers of protection in place for our key workers, for the people they serve and for our communities. Like vaccination, testing is one layer of protection, but it has to be supported by appropriate PPE and strict hand hygiene. And the reason we're following that advice is to prevent more people from dying. We prevent more who are vulnerable to serious illness and death requiring NHS care and thereby protect the NHS. Now, I don't need to tell anyone here that the situation remains precarious and extremely serious. The pressure on the NHS is severe and it's increasing. There's been a rapid rise in the number of COVID-19 hospitalisations in the past two weeks, fuelled by the new variant strain, and we're at the highest rate in the pandemic to date. The Scottish Government is in daily communication with health boards and their planning partners to ensure that we use the whole country's capacity appropriately. We've already doubled ICU capacity since the start of the pandemic and have the ability to treble it subject to staffing. 
NHS Scotland is using the independent sector to ensure clinically urgent patients can continue to be seen and treated. And this additional support comes on top of the extra capacity already being provided by NHS Golden Jubilee and NHS Louisa Jordan for a number of elective treatments and outpatient appointments. Now, since the start of this pandemic, we've worked hard to ensure that infection prevention and control measures in hospital and other care settings are robust, and we expect our health boards to have the highest standards. However, we know that as community prevalence rises, so too do the number of hospital onset cases. In line with increases in community prevalence, we've seen the number of hospital onset cases increase since October last year. Whilst transmission of COVID-19 is more likely where people are in closed settings, including within hospitals, we have robust IPC measures in place. That includes risk assessed patient care pathways, the appropriate use of PPE, the extended use of face masks and coverings in all areas of the hospital, physical distancing, robust outbreak management, and testing to minimise nosocomial transmission as far as possible. The guidance is developed by IPC experts on a four-nation basis, and it's reviewed continually in light of new and emerging evidence. Now, I recognise that while there is currently no evidence of a clinical need to change guidance, I understand that the Chief Nursing Officer keeps this under active review and engages with staff representatives on PPE guidance and the use of FPP3 masks. And I believe that staff should be able to exercise the risk assessment process to have access to the PPE that's considered professionally necessary. Yes? The I was just Oopsie daisy. The Minister's actually in our last minute, but if you're prepared to do this very quickly, it's, as you're leading the debate, it's, it's, yeah, it's I'll leave fine, it I'll to the it. members, right? Yeah, I'll take it. Grateful, um, and it was remiss of me not to welcome Mary Gouge onto her post. I didn't realise that she was going to open the debate, so welcome to, to the Minister. Um, the BMA have also made a really important point to the government. I know they're awaiting a response about poorly fitting PPE, especially for, for women doctors who are still struggling to find masks that fit and pass the fit test. What is the government's response? Minister. Uh, that's an issue I'd be happy to get back to the member on in more detail. Um, in conclusion, of course, the best way to ensure our health service is protected and to limit the number of people needing to be admitted to hospital is for people to stay at home and to abide by all the national restrictions. That's our shared response to protect ourselves, our NHS and save lives, and it's needed now more than ever. But just before I finally close, I want to return to vaccination. I'm afraid this, you can't. I'm afraid you can't. Just, it was just a final brief point, uh, a, a presiding officer. A sentence. A sentence. Uh, yes, it's the largest logistical peacetime operation Scotland's ever seen. It's functioning well. We've already vaccinated a higher per percentage of our population than most other countries worldwide, and we want to see this be a success. And I would encourage all members to get behind us in that endeavour. Thank I, you. And I can't recall if you moved your amendment. Minister, I can't remember if you moved your amendment or not. Did you move it? I'll move the amendment. Yeah, I'm sorry to give you such a hard time on your debut here. Um, <laughs> call on Morris Golden to uh, speak to move amendment 2384.1. Um, that's seven minutes, Mr Gold. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I believe it was uh, supposed to be Donald Cameron, but I'm happy to, to open nonetheless. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'll move the amendment in Donald Cameron's name. Uh, uh, sorry, um, truthfully, should Mr Cameron, I don't see him anywhere around. He's virtual. Well, it, right, well, you know, my little script, I stand to be corrected, has Morris Golden opening and Mr Cameron closing. I think we better leave it like that. Do you feel you could cope? Uh, well, let's see. I'll, I'll, <laughs> get, I'll get on with my. I'll, I'll get on to Miles Briggs. Uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This pandemic has challenged all of us in ways we can never imagine, and the NHS staff have been on the front line since day one, putting themselves at risk on a daily basis to care for others. And with the vaccine programme now underway, it is NHS staff who have once again stepped up to protect the rest of us. From GPs to nurses to pharmacists to drivers, they are working hard to ensure the population is protected. We owe them all an enormous debt of gratitude. And more importantly, we have a duty to do whatever we can to support them. That includes providing them with appropriate protective equipment, the British Medical Association 
have raised concerns over the suitability of some of the current recommended PPE to protect staff from the new, more transmissible strain of COVID. They are calling on the Scottish Government to change recommendations where there are real concerns over safety. I share those concerns and join them in calling for the current provision to be reviewed. There must be no compromise when it comes to the safety of our NHS staff. Nor can there be any compromise in getting the vaccine rolled out as quickly as possible. However, over the weekend, we saw vaccinations actually slowing down, dropping by 3,000 per day. Based on current trends, that would mean the government's own target of vaccinating 560,000 people by the end of the month will be missed but as by as much as 100,000 people. And it is important to note it's important to note who those people are, the most vulnerable in our society. They are quite rightly being prioritised for vaccinations, and it is vital they receive it as quickly as possible if we are to save as many lives as possible. Yet we see reports of 100-year-olds in the First Minister's own constituency still waiting for the vaccine. Meanwhile, other parts of the UK have been able to get the vaccine out to the very elderly more quickly and are now moving on to those aged over 70. In fact, the UK government... Yes, happy to. Thank, Thank, the Secretary. Thank you very much, and I promise to be very kind, uh, Mr Golding, since you didn't think you were going to do this. But will the member accept that we started, as JCVI recommends, with those in care homes, and that that takes longer, as indeed the UK government is explaining now uh, in terms of how they've pivoted back to do that, and therefore to compare the speed with which the vaccination programme is being rolled out here with the rest of the UK is a false comparison. What matters is whether across the UK all of us are pointing in the same direction we are and all of us meet the targets that we've set, and I am confident that we will. Mr Golden. Perfectly timed, Cabinet Secretary. I was going to say the UK Government's vaccination programme is moving at almost double the speed of the Scottish Government, but part of that, as the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted, is because the strategy of targeting care homes, which does take longer, uh, is a reason behind that comparison. And as you say, it is in some regards a false comparison. However, there are still issues and we know that Scotland has a strong supply of the vaccine, around 700,000 doses, but the chairman of the British Medical Association's Scottish GP committee, Andrew Buist, has warned of patchy distribution of doses to GPs. That would explain why doctors who are eager to get the vaccine to patients cannot. Dr Buist has also raised concerns about the vaccine programme being hampered by red tape. One GP went so far as to say they have been overwhelmed by the bureaucracy, which is hampering efforts to recruit volunteers to administer the vaccine. And GPs are already under enormous pressure after being on the front line of this pandemic for almost a year. Working at the heart of a mammoth vaccination effort only adds to that. The BMA would like to see the government step up communication efforts to ensure the public understand the situation GPs face and to help ease the pressure. I hope ministers will address this particular point and outline any further me measures they can take to help GPs at this time. And there is a, already a hopeful sign the vaccination programme can speed up now that the British Army have been called in to help and around 100 military personnel will step up uh, to set up over two dozen vaccination units for the NHS, something that I'm sure all members of all parties will want to welcome. It will be a big boost to get vaccinations out across Scotland, and I wish the First Minister um, all the very best with that vaccination rollout. I want to raise the important issue of the almost unbearable strain our NHS is under. I already touched on the huge workload facing GPs, but the pandemic has seen our healthcare system as a whole impacted. Over 100,000 people are waiting on key diagnostic te tests, and my own inbox has seen constituents contact me about delayed cancer treatment, cancelled operations, and long waiting lists. Those patients must not be forgotten, nor must the need to help our NHS recover 
as quickly as possible. People's lives and well-being are, are at risk. The priority for everyone, including uh, members across the chamber, should be backing our NHS to deliver the vaccine, treating patients and recovering as quickly as possible. I hope that these benches and benches across this parliament will support the Scottish Government's e efforts in the vaccination rollout. It's something that we want uh, Scotland and uh, the Scottish Government to succeed on. And finally, I would like to welcome Mary Goujon to her new ministerial role. Thank you very much. And, and can I say that if you can get a little message to Mr Cameron, who's been listening, of course, is he can move his amendment, but not you. Right, there you are. We've landed him with that. He serves him right for leaving you like that. Um, and we'll now have, uh, I now call him Patrick Harvey, please. Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome Mary Gujan to her new ministerial role uh, and welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate. There's a great deal in the Labour motion that I agree with. In particular, I'm sure everybody in the Chamber and in Scotland will share the appreciation that Monica Lennon expressed to those working on the front line of the pandemic, and in particular to those working on the, the vaccine programme. I share the concern about the equal prioritisation of home care staff and about the wider pressures that are building on the NHS and the time that it will take. Even after the pandemic has subsided, we hope, the time that it will take to, to deal with the backlog. And the PPE concerns as well, I've had the opportunity to discuss that uh, with unions, and I don't believe that the concerns are that the current guidance is not being properly implemented, or at least that's not the majority of it. It's that the guidance itself doesn't necessarily treat, for example, uh, proximity to someone who's coughing in the same way that it treats uh, aerosol-generating procedures, and that the guidance itself needs to be stronger, uh, and that concern is underlined as well by the new variant. So I, I welcome the fact that all of these issues have been raised. And I do have concerns with some aspects of the motion, though. It seems to me that passing a resolution in Parliament about the dosing schedule for the vaccine seems at odds with the principle that we should be led by expert advice. The JCVI is the advisory body, and its clear goal for phase one is protecting those at greatest risk of mortality. They recognise in their paper at the end of December that wider questions for priority uh, for occupational groups at risk of being infected is a legitimate policy choice for phase two. I've raised those issues myself, for example, regarding teachers, but I have accepted that these choices about the next priority groups should not be at the expense of slowing down the delivery of the vaccine for the current priority groups. Now, even if Labour colleagues are convinced that vaccine supply would be adequate to achieve what they're looking for, accelerating the second dose for any group inevitably means slowing down the first dose for some others. It also seems to me that there's no reason to specify the end of February in particular. We know that there were concerns about the change to the 12-week timing for the second dose. And I think, for the most part, MSPs have understood and accepted the reasoning behind that decision. I don't see evidence which would change that. And even if there was, different health and care staff will have received their first dose at different times. So a deadline of the end of February for all of them does seem arbitrary. Presiding officer, we all want the vaccine. We want it now. And if anyone could click their fingers and make it available to everyone sooner, we would. But frustrating though it is to recognise, delivering this will take time. And people will be impatient. That's an understandable reaction. I feel it too. We all want this to be over. That desire to end this crisis and move on raises another concern, which I addressed in my amendment. And though it wasn't selected for debate, I hope the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary will reflect on it in the closing speeches. Because as we see more people being vaccinated, I think we will inevitably face an expectation that the public health restrictions will be lifted soon and that vaccinated people can start getting back to life as normal right away. This may not be possible. 
lifting those measures may require a very high level of vaccination across all population, so the people first vaccinated may have to wait longer than they expect. But beyond this, we may all face the need to keep the virus under control even once vaccination is widespread. Vaccination will pretend, pr protect us from getting ill, but if it doesn't stop the virus itself from spreading in the population, and we don't know this yet, then it won't prevent the risk that the virus continues to mutate, giving rise to potentially more dangerous variants against which the vaccines may not protect us. Only the eradication of the virus, rather than our protection from getting ill, can address that risk. The First Minister yesterday, in her COVID statement, acknowledged the prospect that restrictions may have to be with us for some time to come. I remain concerned that public expectations are already racing ahead of us. We need an honest reflection on this issue and a way to find uh, we need to find a way to ensure that public expectations are realistic. As I said, presiding officer, we all just want this to be over. I, I want that too, as much as anyone. We want hope for the weeks and months ahead. But I don't want people to face the despair they may feel if unrealistic expectations are built up, only to be dashed. So I ask the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister whoever's closing in the debate for the government, reflect on what the government can do to map out for people a realistic idea of what lies ahead for all of us. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I call Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the Scottish Labour Party for making time for this debate this afternoon. I support absolutely every aspect of it, but will focus my remarks um, on the rollout of the vaccine because, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is fast becoming an issue of utmost importance to the vast majority of people we were sent to this chamber to serve. No other single matter commands more space in my inbox right now. And that is unsurprising because be it Pfizer, AstraZeneca or Moderna, this is our way out. For the first time in this hellish year, we have a light at the end of the tunnel in the form of these vaccines and people quite understandably want them yesterday. It is therefore frustrating to me that for some reason, we appear to have a stockpile of several hundred thousand doses, people keen and qualified to vaccinate and limitless waiting and willing arms for, to put it in. But this government seems unable to quite connect those dots in a way that they have in England and in Northern Ireland. I was expecting this intervention, but by all means. Cabinet Secretary. That's good. Um, would the member care to elucidate for me all the evidence he has to support all the assertions he's just made about what we have, what we're sitting on, all the people waiting, all the people desperate, and we somehow willfully are refusing to use them and refusing to use the, stock, the so-called stockpiles of vaccination. Where's the evidence? Yes, and interventions must be short. You'll have to absorb that because we're tight well, for time. And I'm quite grateful for that because I will cover all of that in my speech. In recent days, we've seen exponential growth of vaccine delivery in England and only improvement by increment here in Scotland. And this points, I believe, to a strategic flaw in the government's approach to the vaccine deployment. Before I continue, I want to be very, very clear the suboptimal pace of vaccine rollout in Scotland, and it is suboptimal, is in no way the fault of our healthcare workers. Indeed, it is from the first-hand accounts of those workers that we are now able to piece together what might be going wrong. According to the profession, the problem is not the want of a vaccine supply to this country. We have a growing stock, but we know we've talked about it, where it is in terms of Movianto. Um, but rather their ability to access that stockpile. One such account was published on Twitter last night by the former director of operations at, yes, Scotland, Mark Shaw, who transcribed the experience of his GP wife. And the Cabinet Secretary may learn something from this. She points to what they describe as a centralised bottleneck in the Scottish system. In England, presiding officer, GPs are in charge. They are leading the local rollout. They are supported from the centre in their decision-making with resources and access to the volumes of vaccine they require. It's built on the premise that GPs know what they're doing, that they vaccinate a quarter of their communities against the flu every single year and can move large quantities of vaccine very quickly if they are in the driving seat. However, in Scotland, the system is not GP-led, far from it. Instead, our system is entirely centralised, where GPs, and I quote, are at the end of the decision chain, writes Mr Shaw. 
The Scottish Vaccine Deployment Plan, published just six days ago, sets out every aspect of the rollout in Scotland, but it builds in two extra layers of decision-making and administration that in England just don't exist. It releases vaccine to community practice based on national assumptions and modelling. And, presiding officer, this has led to a situation where GPs across my constituency could only order vaccine once a week in a, at an appointed time at the start. If they missed that booking slot, they would have to wait another week. But the worst part of this arrangement was that they could only order 100 doses at a time. The Cabinet Secretary confirmed that to me in this very chamber. Presiding officer, 100 doses. A busy practice can shift 900 flu jabs in a weekend. Small wonder then that a GP in, in my constituency told me that he'd been prepared to come in on Saturday and Sunday to vaccinate the over 80s round the clock, but had insufficient quantities of vaccine to make that happen. If you can't trust our GPs with this, who can you trust? Presiding officer, we need to trust them now and we urgently need to reform the rollout plan. The second point that Dr Shaw makes is something I have raised repeatedly. We have a large and growing number of qualified would-be volunteers, people with clinical training who have retired, moved into other professions or who, because of the restrictions of COVID, cannot perform their normal discipline, willing to join the vaccine effort. They have been unable to do so and they have come to me and I very much dare say they've come to each of you as well. Presiding officer, if you Google the words volunteer to help with the COVID vaccine, you will find a slick website from NHS England for qualified individuals to do just that. There is no such site in Scotland. And what is worse, these valiant of individuals have heard from Scottish public health officials at the COVID committee last week that they are not currently needed. That is unacceptable. In a heartbeat, we could add thousands of qualified volunteers to the pool of vaccinators and accelerate delivery overnight. And I do mean overnight. While we have a qualified army of vaccinators, a growing stockpile of vaccine and arms to put it in, we must seek to upscale our delivery programme to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And a petition to that end, in my name, in my constituency, has already gathered 3,000 signatures. And when I asked the Cabinet Secretary if she would expand the rollout in this way, she replied, if that's what people want. Well, presiding officer, this is what people want. As the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, Roddy Dunlop QC himself, put it, if you can get people out of bed at 4 a.m. for a flight to Magaluf, you can get out of bed at 4 a.m. to get vaccinated. If we enlisted all of those who want to be a volunteer, we need not ask any more of those already in the field to make a 24-7 rollout possible. And by so doing, we'll cut the final to totals of COVID mortality and the length of time that our communities have to endure lockdown. Presiding officer, this government has considered the deployment of these vaccines through the prism, the prism it knows best, that of centralisation and of control. And you must conclude. They need to realise that, that... No, no, no. OK. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mr Golden, I think you have something to say to the Chamber. I hope I am not giving you the wrong prompt again. I uh, would like to move the amendment in my name. <laughs> I have just signed. There have been surreptitious signatures taking place. Um, we're now, <laughs> sorry about that. I now go to the open debate. Tight six minutes. Sarah Boyack, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm really glad that we've got today's debate because, like others, I do want to highlight the fact that I have never had so many anxious and angry emails. And this is one of the topics that people have been writing to me about. And I think it's important that we have the capacity to have this discussion about the vaccine rollout because they're the issues our constituents are worried about. And we've got the ministers immediately in front of us, rather than taking months to write letters, and by the time you write back to us, the advice has changed. So let's make the most of it, because our debate is aimed at giving us the chance to highlight the concerns our constituents are raising and to be the constructive opposition that we need to be, which is being constructive and saying what the challenges are. I also do want to start off by agreeing with others about this is a fantastic chance for us to thank the health and social care workers across the country because without their tireless work, so many more people would have lost their lives to this horrendous disease. And the bravery that health and social care workers have shown, continuing to go to work every day when some of them have had inadequate PPE and until recently, not just with no end in sight, but thinking we'd actually got through it in the summer. The, the emotional and well-being stress on those staff cannot be imagined. And the impact on their friends and colleagues and family is also huge. 
I also want to highlight the lessons that have been learned in treatment and the support that patients have got, because that is inspiring. And when we look back at this period in history, I think this is one of the things that will stand out the most. I want to agree with the point that Monica made about the briefings we've had from trade unions. We all get briefings from trade unions, but you don't normally get the fine-grained detail we've had over the last few weeks, the regular updates, the examples of problems they've had. And in going back to the trade union reps, effectively what's happened is that although there is guidance out there from the Scottish Government, in, in terms of line management and what's happening in some of our care homes or on-front care delivery in people's homes, not all those rules are being abided by. And there's certainly not the PPE available at the standard that staff need. And the lack of rollout of testing has made many, many people vulnerable in a way they didn't need to be because we've had this virus with us now for the best part of a year. I want to reflect on the comments in our motion about the need to support people who are working in homes. Because just in the last few days, I have had the concerns of somebody who got in touch with me who was working in somebody's house and, sorry, working in a series of homes, not being told that the people she was caring for had been tested positive. So there's a real issue here about communications and testing and PPE. Because the point in the Greens Amendment is right that the vaccine is not just a cure for all for those who've had the vaccine. We need to manage expectations because by May we're still only going to have the over 50s um, vaccinated in terms of age groups. So there will still be huge numbers of people to be vaccinated. And for those who are key workers, I think we particularly want to uh, raise some of the difficult questions they've asked that we just cannot answer. So I would give you one example. Um, somebody in the health service got in touch about the Pfizer vaccine. And this comes back to the two dose uh, schedule. They were told um, that they were going to get it with the second dose on the 28th day. A lot of them feel very much let down because although they get relief from the first dose, they're now worried about the lack of the second one being in sight and they're worried about risks and they're worried about taking the virus home to their families, especially those who've got uh, relatives who are at risk themselves. So I think that would be a very good issue to be directly addressed in the summing up speech. And in terms of vaccinating the healthcare staff, uh, if it's a really brief one, yeah. The really brief one secretary. is that the explanation for that has been sent to all MSPs and it was covered in the briefing that all MSPs were offered that involved our clinical advisors. So MSPs themselves have a responsibility to pass on this information. Sarah Boyk. Well, my point is we can push that information out, but we still get people... This was, this was somebody who got in touch last night who got in touch because they knew we were doing this debate and they were pleased about it. Our constituents get the massive pressures our NHS is facing, but they are really worried about delays to operations and treatment. So I think it's vital that in uh, the government, they are now planning ahead to make sure that staff are supported, not just to get to the end of this virus, but actually in the coming months, because people are keeping going um, just in the hope that we're going to get to the end. And the reality of having to remobilise everything and deal with massive delays is going to be stressful in itself. So I think it's important that we learn lessons about the handling of the, this virus for future transmissions, but we don't just look at the short-term crisis. Think about delayed discharges. We all agreed it was a bad thing. It was eliminated in the space of a couple of weeks. We mustn't go back to that. We need a national care service. We've also got to focus on people's well-being, their mental health, and the community networks that are needed to support people. And I just want to finish on this point. Everyone praised the Christie Commission. Would you believe ago, it was 10 years ago this June, but we've still to see its recommendations implemented. And coming out of the pandemic, I know the focus will be on crisis issues, but we've also got to focus on prevention as well. Let me just give you the statistic that we were given today. One in 10 women wouldn't currently attend a cervical screening test because they're worried about their safety. Yet this is not the time to delay tests like that. So we've all got to focus on prevention. 
It's not just about no, saving no. money, it's lives as well. Thank and you. We need, to, we need to make sure that happens as we reflect on this Thank debate you. today. Thank you. Sorry, but if you do take interventions, I'm sorry. You have to absorb it in your time. I have warned you. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Brian Whittle. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. There's no doubt that the ongoing public health crisis, the like of which this country is not facing generations, is the challenge of our lifetimes. And unfortunately, COVID-19 infections and mortality remain high across the UK, Europe and beyond. And the situation we face in relation to the new variants of the virus is extremely serious. For the past 10 months, we've all had to comply with necessary restrictions on our daily lives. And yet, during the first week of January, deaths were 34% above normal for this time of year. These figures remind us how deadly this virus is and how much worse the situation would be if people were not socially distancing and, by and large, behaving responsibly. I therefore beg his belief that some, including the new leader in Scotland of Nigel Farage's latest venture, still argue that life ought to go back to normal now as if nothing was happening. In reality, at least 5,468 people as of today have sadly lost their lives in Scotland to this virus, with a record 1,610 deaths recorded yesterday across the UK and over 2 million globally in less than a year. My condolences go out to everyone who's lost a loved one along with heartfelt thanks to each of our fantastic lifesavers and caregivers who have worked on the front line throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Those working in our hospitals and care homes with such dedication and commitment have done an amazing job in the most challenging of circumstances. Although enough cash payments can never express our full gratitude to those who continue to care for us, the Scottish Government's £500 thank you payment demonstrated the country's appreciation for their work in the toughest of circumstances. Equally, we all owe a great deal of gratitude to unpaid carers who face enormous challenges, particularly in recent months, and really are the unsung heroes of this pandemic. I therefore welcome the Scottish Government's announcement that an investment of three quarters of a million pounds in local carer centres will increase support for unpaid carers of all ages in order to help them take a break from caring and access other much needed help. This funding acknowledges the many pressures facing carers, especially while respite breaks are restricted or unavailable. Despite the seriousness of the current situation, we must not forget that we now have more reasons to be optimistic than only a few months ago. And although describing the arrival of vaccines as light at the end of the tunnel has been a little overused recently, the vaccine rollout really does provide us with some much needed positive news going forward, with almost 310,000 people in Scotland vaccinated by this morning. While Labour is now preoccupied with its latest leadership election, if only Michelle Ballantyne had waited a week or so, she might have a greater appeal to Labour's money men. The SNP government is working hard to ensure we vaccinate as many vulnerable citizens as possible, the biggest such logistical operation in Scotland's post-war history. This is our national priority, and it's particularly encouraging that almost all care home residents have now been vaccinated in Scotland, despite the logistical challenges involved in reaching these particular people. And I have to say, one of those residents is my own mother. Health and care staff and the over 80s at the apex of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation's list of priorities will all receive their first dose by the start of February. Other groups, including those aged 70 and over and the clinically extremely vulnerable, will be contacted in the coming month. Depending on the supply chain, the Scottish Government is on track to ensure the entire adult population receives the first dose of the vaccine by the autumn, which would be a fantastic achievement. Of course, from vaccine supply and prioritisation to PPE guidance, and furlough, much is either decided on a four nations or at UK level, limiting the flexibility of Scottish ministers to, for example, mirror Israel in buying in and vaccinating its population faster than anyone else. I understand Monica Lennon's concerns that home care staff must be given the same priority for testing and vaccination as other frontline health care staff. Home carers should be contacted by their employers who must ensure they are being given appointments. And Monica is also right that the current health crisis will unfortunately create a backlog of clinical demand from which our NHS will take years to recover from. It is the same everywhere, with 4.5 million operations cancelled in England, for example. The motion notes with serious concern the extreme pressure on the NHS as COVID-19 hospital admissions have increased during the second wave believes that the cancellation of elective procedures, delays to treatment and continued long waits for care are devastating for patients and that these create a backlog of clinical demand to be addressed. I asked about this myself last week at FMQs and the Cabinet Secretary for Health is addressing it head on. I am encouraged that five independent hospitals are supporting NHS Scotland with elective care from this week, 
But we shouldn't underestimate the challenges that lie ahead for our health service, even after the pandemic is over. And I concur with colleagues such as Sarah Boyack in, in saying that. And yet I must say that I have every confidence that should voters put their trust in the Scottish National Party again in the upcoming election, our health services will continue to be in safe hands. Why? Well, let us look at how far we've come in recent years. Scotland's core A&E services are the best performing in the UK. There are now 19,500 more staff in Scotland's NHS, a 15% increase since September 2006, including record levels of staff working in mental health. Our patient safety record is among the best in the world, with a huge reduction in hospital-acquired infections and a reduction in hospital mortality of over 11% in the four years to November 2018. We protected free tuition for nursery and midwifery students, increasing their bursary to £10,000, while parking charges at all NHS run hospitals were scrapped, saving patients and staff over £42 million. And health spending will exceed £15 billion this year, a record with resource funding up over 62.9 per cent under the SNP. Resigning officer, as we grapple with the ongoing health crisis, we must continue to follow restrictions to save lives and ease pressure on our NHS. Although the first few weeks of 2021 have been difficult, the successful rollout of the vaccination programme provides us with a lifeline. Going forward, I have every faith that this SNP government will continue doing its utmost to support our health and care workers, as they have done for the past 13 and a half years. Thank you very, thank you very much. <laughs> and with another unexpected change to the script, I think it's actually Jamie Green and not Mr Whittle. Am I correct? Tell me. I, I, no, no, you tell me, Mr Green. I'm, I'm, I, you're the ones making faces. Uh, Jamie Green to be followed by Sandra White. There you go. I've made an executive decision. Presenting officer, I'm always happy to speak in the chamber whenever I ask to. But uh, unlike the last speech, mine won't be a party political broadcast because this is a debate about COVID and quite a serious one at that. Um, also, the very essence of this debate, I think, is about uh, Monica Lennon wants to raise some of the concerns and challenges that members have about the vaccination programme. And I think that's all completely fair and reasonable things to, to raise as opposition members. But I think we also have to recognise that the very fact that we're talking about a vaccine is something close to a miracle. Because thanks to the efforts of government, scientists, academics, we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, we've ploughed in a lot of money into research and development, academia and the pharmaceutical industry. And we also have to thank those who took part in the clinical trials, so selflessly and bravely, actually. You know, we've managed to do in a matter of months what it often takes years, decades, and sadly in some cases never to achieve. We would be having a very different conversation in the chamber today if there was no vaccine. It, it really fills me with dread to think about what life would look and feel like right now if there was no end in sight. Because I know people who have really hit a wall this past year because this virus has taken such a toll on all of us. Today is a, a day of hope and change, even as we speak right across the globe. So I make my comments in, in that light, constructively and, and positively. Uh, there are things that are positive, there are things that are heading in the right direction. The UK as a whole of four nations per head of population ranks as fourth in the world in our rollout of the vaccination. But of course, as is always the case, this is a virus of more than numbers and statistics. It is a story of people and their lives and also, sadly, their deaths. And in our case in Scotland, some seven and a half thousand of them. Now, we're used to these numbers uh, and talking about them and hearing about them on a daily basis. But there are people behind these numbers. This is a virus which hits the elderly and the sick the hardest. That's the very nature of the COVID virus. And so by that logic, it is the elderly and the sick who must be protected first too. And I don't hear any disagreement politically on that, but the nub of our argument today is that we think progress is not as quick as it could or should be in our view. And that's not just our view, that's what we're hearing on the ground. Unfortunately, this is a numbers game but it's a numbers game of a human consequence. Two unfortunate but very intertwined issues. I, like many, am absolutely petrified that my mother will catch COVID and not survive. Like many people, so behind every number is a real life situation. We are not immune to that. But as we've seen over the last few days, there is political discourse in all of this as well. It is inherently political debate. I'm not in the UK government. I'm not in the Scottish government. I have no idea how many doses are sitting there ready to be administered. But I do know from the government's own figures how many doses have been administered. 
And I don't know if there is a delta or what that delta is, whether it's 4,000, 40,000 or 400,000. I don't really care. What I do care about is that we get those doses into the arms of the people who need them most. That should be the premise of our debate today. Now, we all know that our local health services are our breaking point. NHS Ayrshire and Iron, for example, has over 200 staff currently in self-isolation. And that surely is adding to the enormous stress of an already strained health service. Cases of COVID continue to rise across the west of Scotland region, a region which has been hit disproportionately hard by COVID for all sorts of complicated uh, reasons. At times, we've seen our hospitals close their non-COVID wards to new patients. And of course, the secondary effects of that uh, are clear, the cancellation of elective surgery. Uh, we know that many people are just simply afraid or reluctant to come forward with symptoms and signs of, of other serious health conditions. Uh, the problem is we do not know the true cost of this until it is too late for some. Because how many, how many undiagnosed, untreated health conditions will push the total death toll even higher in the months and probably even years to come? Uh, of course, the loss of our loved ones in care homes continues. You know, at the peak of the pandemic in April last year, half of all deaths due to COVID were in care homes. Half. Uh, and that was the same in many countries across the world. But the statistics last week tell us that it's still one in four. Now, I appreciate that is a lower ratio. Progress has been made, but it's still too high. And I think in the fullness of time, questions will be asked, rightly of all governments, what lessons were learned between those two peaks between last year and this year. It's not just care home residents or staff. There are thousands of paid and unpaid carers out there in our communities looking after the elderly and the sick. One got in touch with me yesterday to say, uh, that she is really concerned. She looks after her 90-year-old parents, but she's not a paid carer. Therefore, she won't be prioritised uh, anytime soon for vaccine. And she doesn't know where she fits into that uh, vaccine process. Another got in touch to say that her husband is a chiropractor. He's in his 70s and still working, good on him. But he's treating dozens of patients every week. And he's worried that he will bring home the, vac uh, the virus to to his wife. Another one messaged me yesterday, an 84-year-old, who said they got a text message to say that their uh, COVID vaccine had been cancelled on the same day. And the surgery said because the supplies that were due to come simply didn't arrive. That's not a political point, it's a fact. There are GPs out there who really want to inject arms but are unable to do so. Starting off, sir, my closing seconds. The COVID vaccine is our quickest way out of this, to open our schools, to get our young people back into the classrooms and protect all our frontline workers. But the supplies are coming through as thick and as fast as they can and are physically able to. But we also need to get them into people's arms as quick as we need to. And that undoubtedly is the responsibility of this government. We all want to get this right because we must get this right. Thank you very much. I call Sandra White, we followed by Brian Whittle. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I, can I just say, yes, it, it is definitely me that's here today. Uh, can I also welcome Mary Cujon to her, her new post? Uh, congratulations, Mary. Uh, I'd also like to thank, like others, uh, all of the, the staff that have been working tirelessly uh, and, and through very, very difficult situations. Uh, I want to thank all of them. Um, circumstances have been difficult, not just for them, uh, but also for their families as well. And I do thank every single one of them for the work they are doing. And, presiding officer, there's been lots of information put out in regards to COVID, uh, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And, you know, I've certainly had uh, emails from constituents and, uh, and uh, myself as well sometimes. Uh, it's like a maze trying to get through this information. Uh, and that's why I do very much welcome this debate. Now, I might not agree with everything that's in the Labour uh, motion or the Tory amendment, but one thing I, I, I do welcome is the fact that perhaps we'll get some clarity for everyone of what's happening in regards to COVID. And that's one of the reasons that, that I do welcome the debate today. I mean, I would like to begin with uh, care homes and the vaccination programme, which I think, you know, I think we should be very, very proud that we now are seeing uh, at least 80 per cent of care home residents have had the first vaccination. Uh, 70 per cent of care home staff and health and care workers as well have received their first uh, vaccination, their first dose. And I think we should be pleased about that. Yeah, we want to go further, but I think it's a step in the very right direction. 
these residents are amongst the most vulnerable in our society. And I think if you look at your society, it's only right that you protect the most vulnerable in that aspect. And I'm glad that they are the top priority of the Scottish Government's access to vaccine. And on that point, I wanted to raise an issue which I just got a, an email in about, and that's to do with other homes which have people who have very serious learning disabilities, and some of them are over 80 years of age. And in my constituency, which I just got the email from, they were informed that they would to get the vaccine on the 11th of January, and they have now been informed of, since 11th of January that it obviously didn't no longer went ahead, but they have no date for it. And that's why I'm glad this uh, debate is ongoing. Perhaps we can get some clarity on that particular uh, fact. And I would welcome anything in su the summary as well. Now, we're talking about home care workers, and that has quite rightly been top of the agenda, along with all the other health workers in that. Now, they are actually on the very front line, the very front line, for caring for people during this pandemic. And they really do give an invaluable service. Now, I know from first-hand experience, as others do from first-hand experience, the care home workers and the home care workers, they go over and above what they're supposed to do. They will check up on, on the folk they look after, after hours, they'll phone, they'll go the extra mile for them. And I think it's really, really invaluable. And I'm pleased that uh, basically, you know, the health secretary has announced that uh, asymptomatic testing for home care workers. Uh, I think it began two days ago, actually. And that's something which I know a lot of people have been pushing for, and it's the right move to make as well. Now, I know that Monica Lennon and others, but mostly uh, Monica Lennon, uh, had mentioned in the motion and also in her comments enhancement of PP recommendations, and I note Jackie Bailey's comments and, and others uh, in regards to the PPE too. Um, but I also want to reiterate what the, the Cabinet Secretary had said in regards to the agreement which was made with COSLA in regards to the adequate top-up of PPE provision. That agreement was signed off with COSLA and the trade unions. And I think that's an important point to mention, and they, they took that position, and they took that on behalf of their members, and basically, I'm pleased that they were working together with the Scottish Government and others. So we've got to remember that the trade unions and COSLA took that on board as well about the PPE provision. And there's also recommendations which have came forward from the Scottish Government that staff who are providing direct care, direct care, should wear fluid-resistant masks. And that's a recommendation also. But to reiterate what the Cabinet Secretary said, basically, the people who they are working for should obey by one, the causal agreement and the recommendations. And I hope, if anyone is listening, if any of them are listening, they will take that particular part on board. There's another issue that I wanted to raise, and I think Jamie Green touched on this particular one. And I raised that at a meeting I had with Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board on uh, Monday morning. And that's in regards to unpaid carers, uh, in regards to that, because uh, basically they have raised this issue, as had others as well. And it would be good to get a sense of clarity as when these carers will be vaccinated. And one of the areas that I did raise with the Health Board was how do we recognise, how do we know who these carers are? And the answer I got back from the health board was that uh, basically the GPs were probably the best people to be able to point them in the direction of where they could get vaccinated when they are being vaccinated. So I think uh, the home carers are ones who we need to look at as well. And, and thank like you. You must conclude there, Ms. White. Also. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, for sending me off, Thank you. I now call Brian Whittled, followed by Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now apparently not closing on behalf of the Conservatives. <laughs> so, can I uh, begin by declaring an interest in that I have a, a daughter who, who is a clinician in the Scottish NHS, and I also want to take the opportunity to welcome Mary Goujon to her post, and I look forward to working with her in the few months that we, that we have left. And I'll thank the Labour Party again for bringing this debate forward. I would expect, given the subject, that there has been much to agree with across the chamber. The pressure that 
COVID-19 crisis has put on our NHS staff has been rightly highlighted again and again. And, and I, along with all my colleagues from across the chamber, I know will always take the opportunity to thank our NHF, NHS staff and support workers for their dedication and commitment in tackling this ongoing crisis. In the Labour motion, they highlight the need to prioritise health and care workers. And I have long advocated that a crucial step in addressing the poor health record that Scotland has is to take care of those who take care of us. I think this was true long before COVID. However, the crisis has brought this to the fore. How can we expect NHSF, NHS staff to deliver the care to us when we, we don't look after them properly? Delivering a world-class environment for our world-class healthcare professionals is something I've been calling for long before COVID. Now, I recognise now is not the time to rehearse some of the Scottish Government's feelings prior to the crisis, but we will have to return to them at some point and again through the prism of COVID, recognise those issues and finally deal with them. Issues like the problems with the QUE, QEU hospital or the New Edinburgh hospital or the Sturrock report which highlighted bullying within the, the NHS uh, services. These issues remain, presiding officer. I think within the motion, the issues of cancellation of effect elective procedures, delays to treatments and continued long waits for care are highlighted. Now, this has the potential to be the next crisis. The waiting time guarantee was routinely missed pre-COVID uh, and the pandemic is creating a backlog that the medical profession are telling us will take years to address. Like many members, I'm sure I've heard from cancer patients and organisations who tell us that cancer detection rates are reduced, which will inevitably lead to an increased cancer mortality rate. Doctors UK told me way back in, in the summer that they estimate there's going to be around 20,000 extra deaths in the UK from cancer as a result of the, uh, of the lack of screening, and it will be much more acute now. Chronic pain management has been difficult to access and in many cases impossible. We heard in the CPG for chronic pain of instances of patients having to travel to England to access the medication they need. Knee and hip replacements can be liberating for those receiving them. Pain and immobility uh, uh, are re immediately reduced prior to uh, post-operation. They tell us that there is a mortality rate associated with that non-treatment. Without question, addiction services are in danger of being overwhelmed as third sector organisations struggle to maintain support and services during the pandemic. The drug death rate will unfortunately rise in the current crisis and NHS services will creak if the third sector is not properly supported. This is the unseen toll of the current situation. However, the most concerning for me is the pressure building on the mental health services during and post COVID. Anxiety, isolation and uncertainty will inevitably manifest itself in an explosion in numbers in presenting themselves with mental health issues. And we know these, issues, these services were under pressure long before the pandemic. And I would appreciate it if, in our summing up of the Cabinet Secretary, we would indicate the Scottish Government's plans to deal with this next crisis. The reality is that the pressure on NHS and staff will not diminish with the end or the hopeful end of COVID. That pressure will just transpose onto those procedures and treatments currently cancelled or on hold while we focus on dealing with COVID. The Scottish Government will also have an eye and a strategy for post-COVID. Not to do so will not only have an impact on the health of the nation, it will also maintain intolerable pressure on the NHS and its staff. If COVID has taught us anything, it has taught us the impact health has on the economy. That impact that poor health has had on the COVID death rate is well known. So we must tackle obesity and diabetes and COPD and heart disease and poor mental health if we truly want to reduce the pressure on our NHS. Finally, uh, pre presenting officer, as it states in the Conservative Amendment, it is very welcome that our armed forces are helping to establish new vaccine centres for NHS Scotland. We recognise their contribution and assistance towards the goal of a COVID-free environment. Presenting officer. Thank you, Mr. Whittle, and for your timekeeping. Can I call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Alec Rowley? Thank you, presiding officer. And as the MSP for Cowdenbeath constituency, I am pleased to have been called to speak in this debate this afternoon. And I see Marie Goujon sitting in, in her seat, and I would also warmly welcome her to her new role. Uh, and at the outset of my brief contribution, which in fact is two minutes longer than I thought it would be, presiding officer, so you might get another good timekeeper here, 
Um, I would wish to put uh, on the record my heartfelt thanks and admiration for all of our NHS staff and all of our social care staff. Their dedication is truly humbling, and without them, we would quite simply have no society at all. And in thanking all NHS staff and all social care staff, I would also wish to thank their families, for it is their families whose support must be invaluable day in, day out, in helping to keep these key workers to uh, get through their very long and difficult days, week in, week out, month in, month out. I would also wish to reference all the families who have lost a loved one to COVID-19. They know sadly at first hand how devastating this virus can be. And I'm confident that they would want us all to pull together and focus on getting through the pandemic. Presiding officer, in this regard, I think it is of paramount importance that we are all very careful with the language that we use and that no one seeks to make particularly the vaccine rollout programme the subject of a political football match. Rather, we should all focus on the facts. And indeed, we heard quite clearly from the First Minister as recently again as this lunchtime, uh, uh, who confirmed that over 90% of care home residents have received their first dose and that 70, over 70% 70 of all care home staff and over 70% of all frontline health and social care workers have also received their first dose. The prioritisation of care home residents was, of course, as per the JCV, JCVI advice, and such advice was so provided on the basis, to put it quite bluntly, that such individuals are at greater risk of mortality from COVID-19 if they contract the virus. We also heard from the First Minister again this lunchtime that all over 80s will have received their first dose at the start of February, with all over 70s and those deemed to be clinically extremely vulnerable to receive their first dose by mid-February, and those over 65 by the start of March, and all over 50s by early May, thus completing, completing the JCVI's initial priority list. That is the trajectory that we are on, presiding officer, and indeed the numbers published not only evidence that, but evidence that this is in fact an increasing trajectory. The second issue I would wish to mention is the inevitable impact of COVID and the number of new COVID cases uh, uh, on the non-COVID elective care. I know that for many, their elective care has been postponed, and I know too how frustrating that must be, but also that health boards have been working very hard to try to ensure that patients are being seen and continue to be treated. In NHS 5, for example, I, I know that notwithstanding the second wave of the pandemic, they have continued to perform much of their elective programme. However, given the rising number of patients admitted with COVID-19, NHS 5 has had to postpone some non-urgent procedures so they can prioritise clinical services for those who are most unwell. The postponed uh, procedures are, I understand, being rescheduled as soon as it is practical and safe to do so. And I would also wish to welcome the, the news in this regard that five independent hospitals, including Kings Park and Stirling, are to be supporting from this week NHS Scotland with elective care. This will provide much welcome additional capacity for our NHS in these unprecedented times. And I think it would also be appropriate to welcome another major development in NHS Fife, which is the uh, work that commenced, I think, from the beginning of last week to replace the MRI scanner at Queen Margaret Hospital in Dunfermline. This project is being funded by the Scottish Government and will see the existing scanner replaced with a new state-of-the-art equivalent. The new scanner is expected to become operational by 2021, and this will be great news for Pfeiffer's where we saw more than 14,000 MRI scans carried out in Fife last year uh, alone. And the third issue I would mention very briefly is to thank the key role that GPs across my Cowdenbeath constituency, across Fife and Scotland, have played and are continuing to play. They deserve our grateful thanks as well. In conclusion, Presiding officer, I think it is important on the issue of the vaccine to reiterate 
that the rollout is progressing to plan and that no one will be forgotten or left behind. I know that my constituents want the facts, not misleading headlines in easy to write press releases. It is also quite clear that we continue to need to reduce opportunities for transmission of the virus to save lives and to protect our NHS. In this regard, again, my feeling is that people do not want political posturing, like, for example, Labour's opposition to the Level 4 travel ban in November of last year. Rather, people want us to take the difficult decisions necessary to get us through to the other side of this pandemic. The Scottish Government has demonstrated that that is what it is determined to do. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Alec Rowley to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. Like many in this chamber, I want to set out today my gratitude and sincere thank you to all health and social care workers who are and have been on the front line throughout this pandemic. Over the last number of days, we have seen on our TV reports from inside hospitals and in COVID wards where the level of pressure are laid bare for all to see. And that reflects the comments from the BMA Scotland Chair, Dr Lewis Morrison, who recently told the BMA members, we have used the expression stretch to breaking point so often that there's a risk that phrase, the phrase loses its meaning. But that is exactly where we are at right now. So if there is an agreement in this chamber that we are all in debt to those workers, there should be equal agreement that we do all we can to ensure their safety as best as we can. And that should also apply to their pay terms and conditions. It's fine to say thank you, but we need greater than simply words. BMA Scotland have produced a briefing for today's debate where they raise concerns about the supply of effective PPE and those concerns must be listened to and acted on. Given the levels of worry within communities, particularly amongst older people with underlying health conditions, it is also understandable that people are keen to know when they are likely to be vaccinated. The Government's amendment for the debate today talks about and notes that the supplies of the vaccine may be patchy in the coming months due to factors out with the control of governments. The First Minister earlier today talked about the Pfizer and the fact they were rescheduling the agreed supply, and I understood what that meant. But I would raise the question, have we got enough vaccine on order? What is happening with the Oxford vaccine and indeed the other vaccines that we'd hoped would come on stream? Apache supply must be seen as a risk and therefore the government has to be more forthcoming on the degree of that risk. Why is there a risk? And most importantly of all, what are we doing to overcome that risk? So I do believe we need more detail so we can assure the public that the timetable we are working to in terms of rolling out the vaccine will be met. And we are confident that the numbers of vaccines required have been secured. I asked the First Minister a few weeks ago about the exit strategy and she said, I quote, the exit strategy now is the vaccine. It is very definite exit strategy that we have not had before. Therefore, the quicker we get people vaccinated, the more we can get back to normal. Given that answer, any risk to the supply must be addressed with the full power of government. But can I also urge the government to recognise the need, once the COVID numbers have been driven down again, to get in place the most effective test, trace and isolate programme that today has not happened. So I would like to see the government bring forward far more detail of the progress it's making on this front as well. Many have focused in this debate on the impact of prioritising COVID on other NHS services. And here again, I believe there is a requirement on government to, pre pre to present a clear analysis of the extent of the issues. The planning for building back on these services must begin now. 
we also have to recognise the need to put in place a national care service as part of that build back, and that will require actions to address the major failings in the current system. The Unite Trade Union has set out three clear actions that must happen in recognition that the backbone of the care service is the people who deliver that service. They call for the establishment of sectorial and national bargaining for all carers not covered by existing and agreed bargaining processes to ensure that standards are met and every carer receives the best pay and conditions. The development of a professional skilled user responsive national care service to oversee and regulate the sector and ensure the highest standards are met and kept up in the sector. And that that body be formed involving stakeholders including client groups, trade unions, employers, local government and Scottish government with a clear mandate to drive through the changes necessary to make the care sector in Scotland the envy of the world. Now, that is how we can learn the lessons and build back better, by putting care in the community on a level playing field with the rest of the NHS, taking the pressure off acute services by having world-class community services. By doing so, we will have learned the lessons from the first time round of COVID and we will be investing in the greatest asset that health and social care have, that is the staff. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Rowley. Can I call John Mason to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I guess, uh, as Jamie Green said, I guess the most encouraging thing is that the vaccination programme is getting underway at all. From being in a position where few people expected a vaccine within a year, we now have three approved and almost all care home residents have had the opportunity to get it. And unsurprisingly, most of us want to get vaccinated as soon as we can. We, have had a helpful, we had a helpful briefing from Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS on Friday, and they explained their intention of giving JAGs from 8am to, to 8pm six days per week. They said they did have the staff to do 24-7, but wondered if people would want uh, the JAG at 3am. I have to say, personally, having spoken to a few folk over the weekend, I think there could be a willingness to get the vaccination at unsocial hours, uh, obviously depending on whether enough vaccine is available. So hopefully this option will be considered going forward. There has been understandable impatience to get the vaccine, as Patrick Harvey was talking about, and especially for elderly relatives and friends. In Monday's statement, Nicola Sturgeon made it clear that over 80s should have been offered a JAG by the start of February. However, even by Monday evening, I had a constituent in contact having understood that over 80s should have already been vaccinated or at least been notified about it. So I do think we all have a responsibility to try to calm people down and urge a bit of patience. None of us is naturally patient and politicians may be worse than most. However, I do think we can help our constituents and the country as a whole if we can urge a bit of calm and patience. Of course, some people will get it a bit sooner than others, but let's not forget that the vaccines are becoming available amazingly quickly by historical standards. I note the suggestion in the motion that the healthcare workforce should have both doses by the end of February. That would be before some over 65s and those with underlying health conditions got their first dose. And I do wonder if what Labour proposes is the right priority, assuming the aim is to minimise the number of deaths. We have been repeatedly told by JCVI and other experts that it is age that is the greatest risk factor and must be the top criterion for getting the earliest access to the vaccine. We have assurance that the first dose gives good protection, much better than we had thought only a month or so ago. Therefore, I do wonder how wise it is to seek to override the JCVI recommendations. Uh, if it's brief, yes. Jamie Green. <coughs> Jamie Green. If the aim is to protect people in care homes, we know the virus is still getting into care homes, so surely uh, getting those frontline care home staff vaccinated with both vaccines seems a sensible approach. John Meeson. Yeah, I think that is going ahead, and I think, but the point is, it's whether you need the second one first. Should some people get the second one before other people get the first? And that had been the advice, but I don't think that's the advice now. I think the analysis in the motion of cancellation of elective procedures, long waits for care being devastating, and the NHS taking years to recover may well be correct. 
However, it is not clear that there is a ready solution to this. Of course, there should be an openness to further preventative measures, and I am sure that the NHS and the Government are open to enhanced PPE if that is the general recommendation. However, we probably need to be realistic and accept that hospitals are always likely to be places where viruses transmit. And to suggest that we could completely, quote, prevent the spread of COVID in healthcare settings is highly desirable, but I do wonder if it is actually possible. It might have been better if the motion had said to minimise the spread. Yes, on the one hand, we want to set high and challenging goals, but on the other hand, we do not want to mislead the public into thinking that 100% safety is achievable. That, after all, is one of the reasons most of us were keen to see older and vulnerable people moved out of hospitals, for example, into care homes, at the start of the pandemic. That was because we greatly feared they would catch COVID in hospital. So I agreed then, and I still think it was the right decision, to move such patients out of hospital if they did not need to be there. Now, mentioning care homes, there has been a certain amount of negative comment about care homes by some people on social media. And can I just say that I used to work in the care home sector and my mother has been in the care home for the last two years. While there will always be the odd exception, on the whole, I have a very high opinion of our care homes. It becomes a person's home, as it has for my mother. Residents have care and company 24 hours a day, which is much more than if they were living on their own. And it is clear to me that the staff genuinely care for the residents. So let us have no running down of care homes in general, or the suggestion that residents do not live in a family atmosphere. Now, I would just like to broaden this out a little and mention the wider world scene. In our rush to get everyone in Scotland vaccinated as soon as possible, I would just urge us not to forget poorer countries around the world. Thankfully, some of these countries do not seem to have been impacted by COVID as much as we have been in Europe, although there is always a bit of doubt over some of the numbers. For example, last time I was at my barber, who is Kurdish, he said Kurdistan had pretty well let the virus run through the country, and now they were just getting on with life. But at the weekend, I was in touch with friends who are medics in a rural part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have seen no sight of any vaccine. My understanding is that the WHO is seeking to ensure that there is fair distribution of vaccines worldwide. That is good. But I would urge both the Scottish and UK governments not to forget the more vulnerable nations and their people around the world. I understand that just this week, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, if I've got his name right, the Director General of the WHO, said that the world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure and the price of this failure will be paid with the lives and livelihoods in the world's poorest countries. So absolutely, we should focus on Scotland and what is happening here. That is our job and what we are elected for. But please let us not forget other parts of the world which are less fortunate than we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mason. And can I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by David Torrance. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The emergence of COVID and its subsequent variants have seen decisions being made that would have been unthinkable a year ago. The idea that our liberties could be restricted, our livelihoods threatened and our children's education disrupted is the stuff of nightmares. And yet as a population, we have been asked to step up and many have had to make sacrifices they did not choose to help save the NHS and protect lives. And they have done so generally willingly. In less than a year, several vaccines have been produced and this is nothing short of incredible. Normally, the discovery and research phase of developing a vaccine is two to five years, with up to 10 years. Normally, this is in the chain of if this vaccine delivers successfully, it will have set new standards of expectation. He encapsulated this very well with his comments. Given that the government's strategy for dealing with the COVID virus is predicated on the vaccination of the population, it has also become essential to get us out of the devastating cycle of restrictions and lockdowns. Having spent 25 years of my working life in the NHS, both as a nurse and as a manager, I am very familiar with the challenges of managing the annual winter bed crisis. I feel for the staff that are having to work not only under the pressure of large volumes of patients, but are also having to work full time in PPE, which without a doubt is both uncomfortable and restrictive, there is also an emotional toll, not only due to, to the personal risk to staff, but because they are often the only person available to distressed and terminal patients as their relatives are obliged to stay away. But the stress to medical and care staff is not just in treating those patients with COVID. For many, it is seeing their patients' treatments and surgeries delayed, 
and the knowledge that the backlog is growing and will take years to address, which for some people will come too late. In terms of the vaccine, I do not believe that this chamber is the right place to make decisions about its administration, as we are not equipped with enough understanding and clinical knowledge to do so, and it is a shame that the motion suggests that we should be. I support the general principle of offering it to the most at risk first, but I am also clear that the vaccine should not be compulsory, but should be administered with, with informed consent. So I would ask the government to confirm that this will be the case. Perhaps most importantly, we need to understand what the tipping point is for removal of restrictions and a return to normality. I am interested in the government's response. How many people have to be vaccinated before we can see a lifting of restrictions? When will the government feel confident that the risk to the NHS has been reduced and the risk to life from COVID suppressed efficiently? The speed of delivery and the assurance of being able to get children back to school and businesses back operating to minimise job losses, not to mention the reinstatement of routine health care, should be all our priorities. I do have concerns about the strategy that has been used to manage this crisis, and the political jibes made in this chamber serve to underpin the unhelpful approach to trying to silence any view other than their own. I believe that the damage wrought by lockdowns will be far worse than the direct consequences of COVID, and this will almost certainly be the biggest challenge facing the politicians that sit in this chamber next session. This is in no way to belittle the awfulness of COVID, but it should focus the minds of those responsible for driving the strategies to consider all the evidence available to them on what works to tackle this crisis, as this may not be the last virulent virus we ever have to face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ballantyne. And I call David Torrance, and at that point we'll move to closing speeches. David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to start, as my colleagues have, by extending my thanks and appreciation to all of Scotland's NHS and social care staff. Our NHS has been transformed by this pandemic, and our social care system has been strained like never before. But despite being faced with these substantial and unprecedented challenges, our healthcare system have all contributed to ensuring the continued delivery of high level of care, excellent services, and expertise that are renowned for. The stresses and strains of the last year have touched the lives of every single person in this country. But throughout it, we have seen them go above and beyond time and time again to support others, regardless of what personal difficulties they may be experiencing. Their professionalism and commitment is to be commended and should never be forgotten. The rollout of mass vaccination programme on this scale was an immense logistical task involving a number of moving parts that was always going to be challenging. And I welcome the news that more than 70 per cent of care home staff and more than 70 per cent of all frontline health and care workers have received the first dose, and that we will remain on track to complete the first dose of vaccines for the JCVI priority groups one and two by the start of February. As it is only right, we are prioritising the distribution of the vaccine to those most at risk, and the decisions about the vaccines are given and that what intervals are made in line with advice from a joint committee of vaccination and immunisation. It is expected that 190,000 healthcare workers and 110,000 social care workers will be vaccinated as part of the overall programme, but the recommendations from the JCBI is clear that priority for vaccine must go to those of the greatest clinical need, which includes residents in care homes, for older people and their carers, frontline health and social care workers, and those aged 80 and over. It was therefore vital that we started by vaccinating healthcare staff working with direct face-to-face -face contact in the healthcare settings, especially those in COVID-red areas in hospital, patients aged over 80 in long-stay elder wards in hospital, and those in care homes for older people. There has been much discussion surrounding the timing of the second dose, and decisions were taken to adapt the approach to allow increased numbers of first doses to be administered and the second appointments to be rescheduled. Professor Adam Finn of the JCVI was clear about the benefits of this approach when he stated, We do need to make decisions here based on the likelihood of what is going to be most beneficial. And what is going to be most beneficial right now for all of us is to reduce the number of deaths and hospitalisations we are seeing across the country. The JCVI recommendations that a first dose of vaccine are prioritised for as many as people as possible in phase one. JCVI priority list, therefore reflecting the need to reach as many people in the shortest possible time frame with an availability of vaccine supplies. This is on the basis that the protection of the vaccines in the first and the two-dose schedule is very substantial. 
We know that in most cases, the first dose offers a significant amount of protection against the virus with a person reaching likely to reach 70% protection in typically 14 to 21 days. It would seem clear to me that it is not only sensible, but vital that we provide as many people as it is feasible and practical with a substantial level of protection as we continue to in our efforts to protect our NHS service. As the MSP for Kirkcaldy constituency, I would like to speak about the significant strides made over the past few weeks to protect those in Fife who are the most vulnerable in the effects of COVID-19 and to praise the efforts of everyone involved. Figures released by NHS Fife last week showed the first round of COVID-19 vaccinations have now been carried out in all of 76 of Fife's care homes as the efforts to protect the kingdom's most vulnerable residents gather pace. Around 5,000 vaccinations have been carried out in Fife amongst care home residents and staff who are amongst them first to be prioritised for immunisation. They also reported being able to ahead of a national average in vaccination in this population and anticipate being able to administer the second dose of vaccinations in March. In addition to this, a further 7,100 healthcare staff working in Fife has also been vaccinated as part of efforts to mend critical NHS services over an extremely busy winter period. With all 54 GP practices participating in COVID-19 vaccination programme, an additional capacity continually being increased through bringing on board of more community healthcare practitioners, including pharmacists and dentists, healthcare staff are working unbelievably hard to vaccinate people as quickly as the supply of vaccine allows. I'd also like to acknowledge the decision taken in Fife to include community childminders within prioritisation for the vaccine, in view of a frontline role in supporting vulnerable children and families in Fife. As previously mentioned at national level, the Scottish Government had prioritised health and social care staff for receiving the vaccine during the first phase of its rollout, but each local NHS board is in turn responsible for working with their local authority to identify health and social care staff to receive the vaccine. Fife Council, working in partnership with NHS Fife, recognises that community childminders are involved in a direct delivery of frontline social care services. Finally, it would be amiss of me not to mention the success of NHS Fife in being one of the two health boards which has received approval from the Scottish Government to roll out an asymptomatic community testing programme following a successful bid for funds. The testing will tar take a target approach focusing on communities where there is a high prevalence for sustained transmission. Research has shown that a large number of total COVID-19 transmissions come from those who have no symptoms and are unknown in spreading it. This expansion of testing system is great news as it will make it possible to identify people who have the virus and target support to help those who are positive and their contacts to isolate so a chain of transmission of the virus can be broken. In conclusion, President Officer, I'd like to commend the efforts of all our health and social care staff and the work involved everyone involved in delivering the implementation of the COVID-19 vaccination programme as we continue to fight this virus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Torrance. And we're now going to move to closing speeches. Can I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Jean Freeman? Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by moving the amendment in my name? Uh, I was slightly thrown by... Um, expecting to open the debate, but uh, Morris Golden, uh, being the experienced uh, improvisation artist that he is, um, did this so ably that I'm sure no one noticed. Uh, can I also somewhat belatedly welcome Marie Goujon to her new ministerial role on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives? Uh, and this is the first health debate in which uh, I and many others have participated with her. I too would like to join with Monica Lennon and other members in paying tribute to all of our NHS and social care workforce, particularly at this critical juncture in our fight against COVID-19. We've all been through another tough period and for many it may seem that there's still no light at the end of the tunnel. But with three vaccines now approved by the MHRA and over 4 million people now vaccinated across the UK, we are making real progress. However, as the recent uh, and troubling news from the Western Isles, the Isles of Barra, and Batisei highlight, we all remain at risk if, we, if um, the virus spreads, even if it is unintentionally spread. So people must remain vigilant and we must continue to follow the advice of staying at home in order to protect the NHS and save lives. It's also critical that we continue to vaccinate as many people as we can, as this really is a race against time and a virus that, as we all know, has proven how deadly it can be. And it is with that aim in mind that we find ourselves here today talking about various issues with the vaccine rollout programme and how it affects health and social care staff in particular. 
Before moving on to these specific issues, can I just address the issue of the JCVI guidelines, which has uh, come up in this debate? Can I stress that the Scottish Conservatives believe that they should be adhered to? But for our part, we do not believe that vaccinating home care staff or making it our ambition that health and social care staff be vaccinated by the end of February with both doses is somehow deviating from the JCVI guidelines. First, home care staff are surely frontline health and social care workers and are therefore priority group two, and then uh, within the top two cohorts. They are not residential care home workers, which are, of course, in priority group one, but they are undoubtedly frontline. Second, and on the two doses point, with 80% already done and vaccination starting more than six weeks ago, it would be possible for this to be done within the JCVI timeframe, at least we should aim high in this regard. Turning then to issues that have arisen about the rollout. First and foremost, we must acknowledge there are significant concerns about delays in getting vaccines to our GPs. Dr. Andrew Burst, the chair of BMA Scotland's GP committee, noted the variable and sometimes slow rate that vaccines were being made available to G GP practices. While some volunteer vaccinators have complained of overwhelming bureaucracy blocking them from being able to administer the vaccine. But it is clear and evident that the fault does not lie with the deployment of vaccines to Scotland. The real issue here is the lack of management of this process by the government, Scottish government and its inconsistency in meeting targets. We learned this week that the SNP government has not used around 400,000 vaccines yeah. which it has in its possession and we still do not know why these aren't being delivered to vaccinators. We also know that last week, for example, fewer than 17,000 people were vaccinated each day, which is not enough to meet the Scottish Government's own targets. And just this weekend, the number of vaccines delivered dropped by around 3,000 per day. Now, the Scottish Government has set a target of vaccinating 56, sorry, 560,000 people by the end of January, but these current figures suggest they could miss this target by quite a significant margin. And it's not just the handling of the vaccine rollout that has been chaotic, but there have been problems on the ground too. For example, it was reported last month that staff at NHS Lothian had to wait up to three hours on the phone to book an appointment. Or just recently, NHS staff in Glasgow had to wait outside the Royal Infirmary for up to four hours to be vaccinated due to a scheduling error. Across Scotland, we hear of GPs waiting for delivery of vaccines, of confusion between who is supplying the vaccine and a huge disparity in terms of when people can expect to get the vaccine. These do not appear to be isolated incidents or just sporadic anecdotal evidence, but rather examples that suggest a patchwork of problems across Scotland in ensuring priority groups receive their vaccines as quickly as possible. The Scottish Conservatives are also concerned about the highly variable rollout of vaccines to those in our rural community. Here in the Highlands and Islands, for example, we know that there are many people in the top priority cohorts who have not yet been vaccinated. Earlier this month, GPs from NHS Highland were complaining that they hadn't yet received any vaccines. And we will all have had emails from dozens of constituents asking why relatives of theirs who are over 80 years old haven't yet received an appointment. Now, I accept this is a challenging endeavour. Clearly, there are greater logistical difficulties in rural and remote parts of, us, of our country. But we must not let that create a postcode lottery. I had one heartbreaking email just before this debate from someone whose parents in their late 90s has not had any indication of when they will receive the vaccine and have been shielding since the 23rd of March last year. Their GP practice had no information available, yet another GP practice not more than 200 metres away had been very busy vaccinating over last weekend and this week. That is someone who is at risk and has been let down. It is also apparent that there are workforce issues that have contributed to the problems that we face in Scotland. And there are many retired medical professionals who have contacted us telling me that they're desperate to help with the vaccine drive, but have encountered a cumbersome application process. These benches also welcome the news that the Army has established 80 new vaccination centres with NHS Scotland, and I want to pay tribute to our armed forces for stepping up to support that effort, as is our, in our amendment. But it is concerning that this collaboration is only happening now, and many are wondering why it took so long for experienced assistance from our armed forces who have significant experience when it comes to logistics. 
Finally, can I touch briefly on the issue of PPE for our NHS and social care staff? The BMA Scotland have recently noted reports that in the light of the higher transmissibility of the new dominant COVID strain, the currently recommended PPE may not offer the best protection in some clinical environments. And that was echoed recently by a nurse speaking to the BBC, who stated that surgical masks aren't working, they're not fitted to your face. This is particularly concerning, and it is clear that this needs to be addressed urgently. So we fully protect our frontline workers from the new variant. Adding officer, the Scottish Conservatives uh, support the motion time, Mr. today, and we hope that others will support That's time, Mr. Cameron. our amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cameron. And I call Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this has uh, been an interesting debate, and a, it's a very wide-ranging motion from Ms. Lennon that we're addressing. I, I regret that in, even in the time available, we've not been able to look in uh, any greater detail at uh, our NHS and social care services and how they are responding to this, the implications of that response, and indeed how we uh, look ahead to how we might build back uh, to more normal services. And I'm very happy the parliamentary timetable allowing and the time available to us before the next election, if it is possible to come back with a government debate on some of the work that we have underway right now to look ahead at how we return our NHS better than it was even before the pandemic. But before I go any further, I, I would take this opportunity, as others have done, to offer my heartfelt thanks to our NHS and social care staff. This is harder for them than ever, not simply because they are seeing more cases, a greater volume, a greater pressure, but that they're doing it yet again. And I completely appreciate how, how many of them are feeling. Let me also start by agreeing with Jamie Green that behind this debate is, is indeed a bit of a miracle, a bit of a miracle that we're actually spending so much time talking about a vaccine, uh, and a vaccine that is uh, part of our route out of this, and I want to return to that. The premise of my work is to get vaccine into as many arms as possible. I tried to set out uh, supply numbers and how that would align with our delivery, uh, but uh, as members know, that was not deemed to be acceptable by my colleagues elsewhere in the UK government, so we withdrew that. Now, my point is this, it's a simple point, I won't spend long on it, but if you accept that the removal had to be made, and some of you indeed called for it, you can't ask for details, which I could set out for you in glorious detail, also support removal of that detail, and then criticise us for not giving you detail, whilst making assertions about what or what isn't available on the basis, I have to say, of very little evidence indeed. Let me turn to some of the specifics around how we are trying to ensure that our country and our health and social care workforce are protected to do the job they need to do. Just, on, just about a year ago, presiding officer, our testing capacity in Scotland was 350 tests per day. It is now 70,000 PCR tests per day in terms of processing. That doesn't inc include lateral flow devices. That is part of a four-nation UK-wide effort. All admissions to our hospital settings are now being tested. All patient-facing health and social care staff are being tested. Testing for home care staff rolled out on Monday. And care home staff have been tested for some time, not only with PCR, but now also during the week uh, with lateral flow devices. Let me turn to the point about uh, hospital-acquired infections. Hospital-acquired infections are really, really important. And of course, Scotland has a very excellent track record in our patient safety programme. But in terms of COVID-19 cases, along with that testing, even before that was fully rolled out and introduced, in the most recent figures published to the week ending the 27th of December, we can see both probable and definite hospital onset COVID coming down from the period before. And even if we include indeterminate hospital onset, that's where it is not entirely clear whether it was acquired in the hospital or not, then again, that is coming down from before. So we need to be clear. These are published information. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to try and rush through this. If I've got time at the end, I certainly will. Uh, so we are trying very hard, and all our health and social care workers are trying very hard, to prevent the acquisition of hospitals of infection from COVID, either in hospital or in the care home setting. But where we see 
significant community prevalence, that becomes very difficult indeed for them to do. In terms of PPE, from very early on, we have acted to ensure that we have direct distribution of PPE to acute primary social care and carers. The volume of PPE that we hold is three to four months across all items of PPE. And in terms of uh, the uh, BMA and the letter, Ms Lennon spoke to me or mentioned in her opening remarks about the letter that has been sent and the BMA was still waiting for a reply. Well, actually, I just saw that letter this afternoon. It was written to the UK government, but this afternoon I am about to clear a response from us to the BMA about what we think should happen and how we respond to their concerns. On, PMA, on PPE, we take advice across the four nations from our senior clinical advisors. And that advice produces the guidance. But in addition, we have always said that the professional assessment of individual staff members should be followed. In other words, you shouldn't deviate and do less than the guidance. But if your professional view tells you that you feel you ought to wear more protection than the guidance says, that should be available to you. And that is what we have set out in our amendment. That is what was behind that agreement with COSLA and unions for home care staff very many months ago. And that is the position I hold and will continue to hold. In terms of vaccines, let's remember two things about vaccines. And, and I'll come back to this in respect to Mr Harvey's point, because I think it's a very important one. What we know about the current vaccines is that they protect us as individuals from serious illness or from death. Not 100%, but actually more protective than the flu vaccine is. But what we don't know yet is whether or not the vaccine prevents us from transmitting the virus from one person to another. So if I was vaccinated, I would be protected, but we don't know that if I acquired the virus, whether that would then be transmitted from me, for example, to Ms. Gujong. That is really important. That links directly to the degree to which vaccination is 100% our route out of this or an important and very necessary and very welcome protection. 75% of our GP a, practices... I know there's a number of points that you wish to... a number of very important points you wish to respond to, but I'm afraid you're out of time, so I'll have to ask you to draw your remarks to a close. OK. Uh, in terms of all the issues around bureaucracy, around supply, we're dealing with those, but members need to remember that only the AstraZeneca vaccine can go into our GP practices, not the Pfizer one. And the final point I want to make, presiding officer, if I may, is this that actually the Louisa Jordan, which could be considered our own first va mass vaccination site, has vaccinated 26,171 people since we first received a vaccine. It will continue to do that over weekends. Others will be opening up. And finally, let me say this. Vaccination is really important, but it is only important alongside testing, compliance with restrictions, and making sure that all of us are right at this minute, stay home, protect the NHS, and save lives. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And can I call on Pauline McNeill to conclude our debate? Pauline McNeill. We all agree that we will never be able to repay the debt to NHS and care workers on the front line and those dealing with the sickest patients, and as we've heard the testimony of many health workers, the death and sickness that they've seen in the last 10 or 11 months, nothing prepared them for that. So almost a year after the first phase of the pandemic hit, our NHS is almost pushed to breaking point again. Staff are tired and struggling to cope with the relentless demands, and having seen it for the second time, it's probably the biggest single worry. Adrian Boyle, Vice President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, said he is worried about the next couple of months because we are in a very much a ba battle stations and there will be short-term surges of morale, but people are tired, frustrated and fed up. He is worried about a burnout. As the Cabinet Secretary rightly says, it's the vaccination rollout together with Test and Protect that is our way out. And I agree with Jamie Green on this point that we owe our scientists a great deal of debt and also with John Mason that it's very important that the whole world, including the poorest, have the rollout of the vaccination. For our countries also feeling the cost in terms of cancelled and delayed operations for other illnesses, a point made by Brian Whittle too. 
As of November last year, there was an 84 per cent reduction in operations compared to the year before, and our routine services have been paused, as some health boards have paused elective surgeries for reasons we all understand. We all hope and pray that this is short term and that the current restrictions will see us turn the corner soon. We'll be going on for much longer cancelling operations than ignoring those who are very ill and need their NHS. I know that ministers are only too aware of this, and I know that they'll be starting to plan soon how we can begin to tackle extraordinary waiting times and treatment. And I hope, and I think the Cabinet Secretary has said in the past when I've mentioned this, it's really important that patients get information and transparency as we go forward so that they have some faith that they're not forgotten about. And if we've learned anything we need from this pandemic, I think it's that we need a plan and a strategy to deal with COVID over the long term. Again, it was the Cabinet Secretary who points out that a pandemic can release new viruses and we know that's something we might have to deal with in the future. But it was Mark Griffin who said recently that long COVID is an industrial disease that healthcare workers are far more likely to be hospitalised from the COVID and we know that many are suffering from the longer term effects. But it does make me wonder if we do need some design of our National Health Service going forward to accommodate this. In some countries, they have COVID clinics. And Greater Glasgow and Clyde have COVID assessment centres that seem to work well. And it's worth considering whether in the long term we need a bit more of this. And perhaps we also need to question the model of healthcare too, because we have super hospital centres of excellence, certainly in my health board they do. But by containing a virus, it may dictate the need for also having smaller satellite hospitals in case we face a future crisis. There are many things that we don't know about the virus, for example, how long the vaccine will give immunity for, and we'll hopefully learn that in time. But it's important, I think, in recognising in the track and trace system, and in those who don't isolate in the many issues that have been raised in this parliament, that many are still not downloading their apps, and that's because they're nervous. They're nervous that if they get a, a notification to say that they have to isolate, that they can't afford to do that. That's why we do welcome the financial support. But we can never miss this point that through hardship, many people are frightened to download the app. And if we can resolve these questions, then we'll get more people who will be complying with it. After a year of disrupted work and finances, then people obviously feel that they can't afford to self-isolate. There's a point I would like some clarification on, if I may, and I want to begin by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for responding very quickly in Hogmanay to a question I had about an agency nurse who felt that she wasn't going to get the vaccine along with her colleagues, and that's been clarified. But I've also had a number of agency staff who say that they have not been routinely tested. I've certainly spoken to two, and these nurses are saying that they go around all different hospitals by the very nature of it. One told me she'd been to Monklands, uh, Crosshouse and Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, and she hadn't been tested. I asked her as recently as uh, two weeks ago, and I wanted that assurance that agency staff will not be forgotten about, both in terms of testing and the vaccine itself. Uh, I appreciate there will be some anomalies uh, when you're of rolling out, as the Minister, uh, Mary Dujon, said this afternoon, a huge logistical project will bring it some anomalies, and that is inevitable. I've been contacted by a constituent who says that she, as an unpaid carer, uh, for part-time for her elderly mother, will receive the vaccination before the full-time carer that she employs to look after her mother, seemingly on the basis that she is employed uh, as a private carer, not an agency. I realise it's an anomaly. I wonder if that could be looked at in the future. So we could be dealing with COVID for years. And many health professionals speculate that we could see like seasonal flu in the way that we need a vaccine every single year. So there needs to be, I think, a look at some point about the redesign of services I've said to look at what lessons we can learn about this episode of COVID. COVID hubs might be the way forward, as I've said, and looking at larger hospitals and how we might have. In Glasgow, when it designed its service and when it created ambulatory care, both in Stockholm and Victoria, it's probably one of the two most important features of the health services that have allowed the flexibility within the service to be able to move patients into the smaller hospitals. I want to make clear in Labour's amendment that we are not arguing for other groups to be moved down the programme that's already set out. I want to be clear about that. But what we're saying is there's certainly a call from the workforce to see whether or not there could be second dose given sooner rather than later, if the supply and the capacity is there. So I wanted to be clear about that. I do agree with Patrick Harvey when he said that 
We do need to give the public a realistic picture of what lies ahead, but I appreciate that we may not be able to do that at this point because we are simply still assessing where we are now in terms of the virus and where we are in terms of our health service. But it does feel that we are on the cusp right now of knowing where we're going to turn um, the corner. I have to say, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, for all of we for all of the sadness and the fears that we've had in this debate this afternoon, I did feel a glimmer of hope personally on the Glasgow and Clyde briefing on Friday, because they are on track for the rollout of, of the vaccine. And I know there will be problems ongoing, and we reserve the right to put our questions to ministers and push further, and we will never, ever stop doing that. In fighting this horrible SARS virus, it's taken the life of millions. We must continue to work together, push the government where we think that there are failures. We must have hope. We have been given hope here in the form of a vaccine. And we cannot forget those who are still very worried and sick that their treatment and their operations are continually delayed. And I think this is the next chapter, and I welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's offer to have a government debate. And in that, and I know that the tackling of the virus is a priority, I would appreciate if there was some addressing to reassure this group that they are never, ever forgotten about and that the NHS is theirs too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on protecting Scotland's health and care workforce. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 23899 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graeme Day to move this motion? Move, presenting officer. Thank you very much. No member has indicated they wish to speak in the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 23899 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motions 23900 and 23901 on the stage one timetable for two bills and 23902 on a stage two timetable for a bill. Could I call on Graeme Day to move these motions? Moved. Thank you very much. And again, no member has indicated they wish to speak on these motions. The question is that motions 23900 to 23902 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 23903 on approval of an SSI. Could I first ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, saying officer. Thank you. Now, I believe Sarah Boyack wishes to speak against this motion. Sarah Boyack. I, actually, I would like to uh, indicate that our group would like to abstain on this motion. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, the reason we want to abstain on this vote tonight is that we believe that there should have been a two-year delay to the requirement for all homes to have um, improved fire safety equipment. The Scottish Government has delayed the requirement for a year. We welcome that. But we think that there's much more needs to be done that there's action that is required to make up for the lack of pro progress so far. The lack of clear information to householders, the lack of support to date, especially for older people in terms of advice, and financial support to those on low incomes, and a critical issue that needs to be addressed that we still don't have an answer to, is support for older people to ensure that they are not exploited. And this is something that age concern remain um, very worried about. We did have a commitment on a communication strategy from the government, from the minister to our local government communities committee, which I very much welcome. But the concerns expressed by the committee about progress in 2019 and 2020 are on the record. There are 600,000 homes in Scotland with no fire alarm now. That needs to be addressed. That is a matter of concern. There are apparently around 900,000 houses with one heater fire alarm, but we don't have the detailed statistics on this because that's not collected, and we don't know, and those households don't know, whether they are compliant with the new regulations. So my conclusion, presiding officer, is we need a significant ramp up of this activity to ensure people's safety, to give clarity on what's required, to ensure there's capacity in the supply chain to make sure that those households, just taking the 600,000 households, have the capacity to get these fire alarms and heat alarms. And one thing to raise is fire safety visits, especially for older homes and households, so that they are supported through this process and so that we have support for low-income families. I do hope the Minister will meet with MSPs going forward and with other stakeholders with updates and progress, so that we are not just here in a year's time when all those houses have yet to be made fire compliant. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Boyack. Can I call on Kevin Stewart, the Minister, to respond? Uh, thank you, President Officer. As part of the work we have progressed on improving fire safety, uh, we introduced new standards in fire and smoke alarms in January of 2019, uh, and these were due to come into force on the 1st of February of this year. These new standards will bring owner-occupied properties uh, to the same level of protection we already have in both the social and private rented sector. However, in light of the current pandemic, I wanted to be pragmatic and postpone the introduction of this standard for one year and provide homeowners with more time to install fire and smoke alarms, to increase public awareness of the need to do so, and to ensure people have access to good information and advice uh, with targeted assistance for those who are un unable to carry out the work without help. And I've given these assurances uh, in this chamber and to the committee. Uh, these regulations will improve protection from fire in people's homes uh, and I believe one year strikes the right balance in providing more time while balancing the need to improve fire safety and save lives. However, uh, as I am pragmatic, I will continue to have discussions with all who want to discuss this with me as we move forward to ensure that we get this right. Uh, amending uh, legislation to postpone the introduction of the new standards uh, until February 2022 uh, was approved uh, through the affirmative procedure by the Local Government Committee on the 16th of December. Some members have suggested that there should be a longer delay um, and therefore um, are disagreeing with today's motion. Um, I don't agree. Uh, but I will continue to talk to folk because I believe uh, that we all share the same uh, view in this, that fire safety should come first. Uh, I'm glad that the move to oppose today has gone because I was worried about uh, opposition to today's motion. Because if this motion were not passed today, that one year postponement would not happen. Instead, the original regulations passed by this Parliament would have automatically come into force uh, in just two weeks' time, on the 1st of February 2021. Um, so I'm glad that there has been a step back from opposing uh, what has been put forward today. Let me be quite clear, um, President Officer, uh, as in all matters, um, if members have issues on any uh, of these things that we have talked about today, I'm willing to meet with anyone. I've already assured the committee uh, that we will continue to update them uh, on how we are progressing uh, with all of this. I want to ensure that we get this right, uh, and I want to ensure uh, that we provide the right level of fire safety for everyone in their homes, no matter what the tenure. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. Uh, however, the next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Could I call on Graham Day on behalf of the bureau to move motions 23910 and 23911, approval of SSIs? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Now, Michelle Ballantyne has indicated she wishes to speak against these motions. Could I call Michelle Ballantyne? Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I wish to move against the motions uh, 9, 23910 and 23911. With only a couple of minutes allocated to explain my objections, can I start by saying my concerns in no way dismiss the dangers of the COVID virus, nor do they suggest decision makers do not care or are not trying to do their best. However, on examining a wide range of available data and analysis on the impact of the COVID virus and approaches to suppressing the virus, particularly the clinical papers produced by doctors, scientists and virologists across the world, I am concerned that a swathe of evidence has not been given adequate consideration in the decision-making process. Studies such as those carried out at Stanford University have examined the work by Imperial College London, which, as I understand it, has underpinned the recommendations that inform the use of lockdown and restrictions. The studies by Stanford, alongside a host of studies published in respected publications, such as the BMJ and the European Journal of Clinical Investigation, point to the conclusion that non-pharmaceutical restrictions, such as lockdown, do not show a strong statistical relationship between lockdown policies and the desired solution of relatively low COVID deaths or the suppression of the spread of the virus. In short, lockdowns don't do what is claimed of them. Worse still, there is growing evidence of the medium and long-term consequences on the health and economic well-being of society that is appearing as a direct result of the lockdowns. After months of restrictions, school closures, heightened fear and worry, young people are now reporting the highest ever levels of mental health issues. Preventing young people from having face-to-face -face social interaction with family and friends, 
by limiting gatherings to two people from two households, as well as removing access to organised ex exercise, will further exacerbate the isolation and hopelessness that these young people are feeling, particularly at this time of year when meeting outside is often not practical. Removing the right to attend worship, which of course is enshrined in law, particularly when houses of prayer have taken every care to ensure the safety of their flock, only adds to the stress that many people are experiencing and removes the support and reassurance that many people value. Having searched through the evidence the government has referenced, I could not identify any substantive evidence that would suggest attending worship creates an unacceptable risk. For these reasons, I cannot support these particular SSIs, and I urge the Scottish Government and my fellow members to consider very carefully whether these motions really make a difference to the war on COVID, or whether they unnecessarily add to the collateral damage that efforts to suppress the virus as they're having. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Ballantyne. And could I call on the Minister Graham Day to respond? Thank you, President Officer. The number 10 regulations introduced the requirement that a person should not leave their home unless they have a reasonable excuse uh, for doing so. This requirement is now in place in all four nations and is supported by all clinicians advising government and indeed the medical community as a whole. It is a necessary part of bringing this new strain of the virus under control, preventing our health service from being overwhelmed and ultimately reducing infections to the level where we can consider lifting these restrictions. As the First Minister has set out, there are some encouraging early signs that these measures are beginning to have an effect in Scotland. But we know that it can take a number of weeks for the measures we as a country take to feed through into the numbers of cases and the numbers of people in hospital. We need to stay the course and see this through, not throw away the hard-won progress we are making, as Ms Ballantyne would have us do. Because the tragic reality is that this virus preys on social contact. It spreads when people come together. The safest thing you can do when levels of the virus are high, as they are at present, is to stay in your home as much as you can. That's what the science shows. That is what the evidence regularly published by all governments in the UK shows. And it is reckless of Ms Ballantyne to suggest otherwise. Indeed, some might say hypocritical, when she appears to be following the advice herself in contributing to these proceedings remotely. The issue of the closure of places of worship is, we recognise, a sensitive one. Communal worship provides people with guidance, support, relief and hope at a time when these qualities are needed most. Indeed. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I would just uh, wonder if he would accept that uh, quite a number of the faith communities are supporting these measures. That although there is some opposition and everybody wants to be going to a place of worship, Many of us do support these as necessary and temporary. Minister. Uh, President Officer, very much so. I, I do recognise that. Uh, because the point here is that whilst we recognise the value that people derive from attending places of worship, there could be nothing more tragic than a person seeking these things and ending up infected and ill or worse, from a virus picked up on the way to or from or at such a service. That's why we've made special provision to allow those who lead acts of worship to leave their houses and to use places of worship to lead remote services so that these services can continue. We recognise that there are some in the faith communities who are upset by these measures, but equally, as John Mason has alluded to, there are many who support them, including the Church of Scotland and the Episcopal Church. And we're engaged in regular discussion with a range of faith groups about these measures, and we take all of their views seriously. We review all restrictions regularly, we're required to do so in law at least once every three weeks. As part of those reviews, we take special account of rights and equalities considerations, including the right, I, I'm just finishing, uh, sorry, uh, including the right to practice your religion. For these reasons, I would invite Parliament not to support Ms Ballantyne in opposing these motions tonight. Thank you very much, Minister. And the question on these motions will also be taken at decision time. The next item is consideration of six more parliamentary bureau motions. Could I call on Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to speak to and also move motions 23904 to 23909 approval of SSIs and 23912 on approval of an SSI? Uh, Presiding officer, I, I move all of those uh, motions in my name and I should speak to 23908 and 23909, I think. 
uh, in keeping with the protocol agreed with the Parliament. 23908 modifies some of the restrictions and requirements of certain levels and sets out changes to the levels that apply in some areas of Scotland. They also amend the Health Protection Coronavirus Protection from Eviction Scotland Regulations 2020 to reflect their policy intention. These regs came into force on the 18th of December last year. Uh, 23909 modifies some of the restrictions and requirements of Level 4, adjusts the list of essential retail and prohibit travel to and from the Republic of Ireland from the 26th of December 2020. Thank you very much, Minister. And the question on these motions will also be put at decision time. Now, before we turn to decision time, I've actually got a couple of points of order um, from last night's vote. Can I call Finlay Carson, first of all? Finlay Carson. I think we actually might be having recurring difficulties with Mr Carson's connection this evening as well, as well as last night. Can I call, in that case, can I try and call Maurice Corrie? And I'll try and re-establish the line with Finlay Carson. Can I call Maurice Corrie? Um, thank, you, President, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, have a point of order uh, on last night's voting. I did try and vote last night. I would have voted no, but I did register that I had problems uh, with the connection, which went blank on me. Thank you very much, Mr. Curry. Mr. Curry, Mr. Curry, can I just clarify? Mr. Curry, are you still there? Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Curry. Can I just clarify, you'd have voted no. Was this on the protection of workers bill? Or can I just clarify what uh, motion you'd have voted no the on? The LCM uh, in Thank you. name. Thank you. The LCM. Uh, that's right. Uh, yes. Which is the. My, my Covert email Human to, Intelligence um, Services Bill. Refers. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Corey. You would have voted no on the uh, Covert Human Intelligence's LCM, and I'll make sure that is well. It's now been added as a point of order, um, but that will be the clarification for you. Thank you. And we'll try one more time with Finlay Carson. I think we're having the same difficulty with Mr. Carson. What I will do is we will proceed to decision time. Hopefully, we'll re-establish the connection with Finlay Carson, and he'll be able to clarify. Um, the point he was making before uh, we finish. So we're going to move now to decision time. The first question this evening is the amendment 23894.3 in the name of Jean Freeman, which seeks to amend motion 23894 in the name of Monica Lennon on protecting Scotland's health and care workforce be agreed. Are we agreed? We're not agreed. We're going to move to a vote. Uh, to, in order to vote and to access the voting app, I'm going to suspend proceedings for a few moments uh, and then we'll resume. So Parliament is suspended for a few moments.
Thank you, colleagues. We are now going to resume proceedings. We are going to go straight to the question. And the question is that Amendment 23894.3, in the name of Jean Freeman, which seeks to amend Motion 23894, in the name of Monica Lennon, on protecting Scotland's health and care workforce, be agreed. Members may cast the votes now. It's a one-minute division. One minute. Thank you. That vote is now closed. If any members believe they were not able to register their vote, please let me know. Can I call Fulton McGregor to make a point of order? Fulton McGregor. I can let Mur Murdo Fraser know that he doesn't need to make a point of order. His vote was registered, Murdo Fraser. We're just trying to get through to Fulton McGregor. Can I call Emma Harper to make a point of order? Emma Harper.
Colleagues, there are two members who um, would like to make a point of order. However, we can't connect with them. Um, I'm going to close the vote because the result is quite a clear result and the two votes would not affect the overall outcome. So the members hopefully will be able to make a point of order at a later stage to clarify how they would have voted. But I'm closing the vote and the result of the vote on amendment number 23894.3 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 64, no 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now, the next question is that Amendment 23894.1 in the name of Donald Cameron, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Monica Lennon, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Donald Cameron's amendment, and this will be a one-minute division. Members may vote now. Thank you. That vote is now closed. Again, any members who had any difficulties voting, please let me know through a point of order. Point of order from Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, it's not connecting to the digital voting. I would have voted yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Ballantyne. That is noted. I'll make sure your vote is added as a yes to that amendment. Thank you. Liz Smith, point of order. Uh, Emma Harper is asking to make a point of order. Can I just say to Ms Harper that her vote on this particular amendment was registered? So her vote on the amendment in the name of Donald Cameron was registered.
Okay, again, I'm afraid if we can't make contact with Liz Smith, who we expect. Okay, we'll try one more time for Liz Smith. Point of order. There's obviously connectivity problems. Storm creased off. Uh, presiding officer, I don't know if you can hear me, but I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms. Smith. We heard that. You would have voted yes on that amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. That vote is now closed, and the result of the vote on amendment number 2389.4.1 in the name of Donald Cameron is yes, 56. No, 62. There were five abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question, is that motion 23894 in the name of Monica Lennon as amended on protecting Scotland's health and care workforce be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on the amended motion. A one minute division. That vote is now closed. Please let me know if there are any voting issues. Now, I noticed that Claire Adamson and Stuart McMillan are both trying to make points of order, but I can assure them both. I'll just double check first. Both, both voted. Both Claire Adamson and Stuart McMillan have voted. And Sandra White, you also voted. No need to make a point of order. And Tom Arthur also you, your vote was registered. No need for a point of order. Thank you, colleagues. The result of the vote on motion 23894 in the name of Monica Lennon as amended is yes, 66, no, 57. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now, the next question is, the mo is that motion. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. So, the next motion, the next question. Is that motion 23903 in the name of Graeme Day on approval of an SSI be agreed? And this is the motion to which Sarah Boyack spoke on fire and smoke detectors. Motion 23903. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. This is on SSI motion 23903, a one minute division.
That vote is now closed. Please let me know if you have any difficulties in voting. And I can assure Mr. Mr. Crawford, for Bruce Crawford, your vote was registered. There's no need for a point of order. Your vote was registered. And Gordon MacDonald, also your vote was registered. No need for a point of order. Mr Macdonald, your vote was counted. Thank you, colleagues. The result of the vote on motion 23903 in the name of Graham Day was yes, 100, no, 1. There were 21 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 23910 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. This is one of the motions to which um, Michelle Ballantyne addressed her remarks. Uh, motion 23910, are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We're going to move to a vote. This will be a one-minute division. Members may cast their votes now. That vote is now closed. Please let me know if you were not able to vote. Thank you. The result of that vote on motion 23910 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 118, no, 1. There were two abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. I thank colleagues for their patience. There's clearly a lot of complicated votes tonight and connectivity issues. The next question is that motion 23911 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. This is the second motion to which Michelle Valentine spoke. The question is that motion 23911 be agreed. Are we all agreed? And we're not. We're going to move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on motion 23911.
That vote is now closed. Gordon MacDonald, your vote was registered. No need for a point of order. Your vote was counted. Thank you, colleagues. The result of the vote on motion 23911 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 96, no, 5. There were 18 abstentions and the motion is therefore agreed. Now, I propose to ask a single question on seven parli parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No. The question is that motions 23904 to 23909 and motion 20912, all in the name of Graeme Day, on approval of S SSIs, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. You'll be pleased to know that we're having our first entirely remote vote tomorrow evening. But on that note, I close this meeting. <laughs>